குழந்தை பணிவுடன் நாம் உணர்வோமாக எல்லா குழந்தைகளுக்கும் அவர்கள் குடும்பத்தினருக்கும் அவர்கள் சமுதாய படிநிலை மற்றும் சாதி மத பிரிவுகளை பாராமல் நலம் கற்றல் ஈகை அன்பு அமைதி ஆகியவற்றின் தூதுகளாக என்றும் இருப்போமாக நம்மால் முடிந்தவற்றை மாற்றவும் நல்லவற்றை உள்வாங்கவும் மாற்ற முடியாதவற்றை காரணத்தில் ஏற்றுக்கொள்ளவும் போதுமான மெய்யறிவும் பொருதலும் எங்களுக்கு வழங்குக உங்களது வாழ்த்துக்களையும் அருளையும் கருணையும் எல்லா சூழல்களிலும் நேரங்களிலும் அனைத்து மக்களிடையே கொடுத்து அருளுங்கள் நன்றி Thank you, Dr. Kobal, and uh, it is uh, respected our president, uh, Dr. Uh, Babu, and uh, uh, Dr. Kobal Subramaniam, uh, President 2021, Dr. Ismail, and the president-elect, Dr. Suresh Balan, Vice President, Dr. Anna Malai, sir, and uh, AAA, uh, Dr. Srimurgan, and editor, Dr. Dashaini, and other uh, IAPTNAC Abhis Parers, and... Um, and i welcome today's uh, uh, convener of the program dr ms viswanathan sir and i welcome today's chairperson dr tangavel sir dr ramachandran sir dr nirmala madam dr lalita janaki uh, janaki raman i welcome today's uh, moderator dr maladi madam and i welcome today's speaker neelam and dr srender yacha and dr uh, the john mathai nitan and dr paniraman dr sris and um, i welcome all the uh, delegates as well as uh, uh, ebs and uh, uh, today's uh, faculty uh, also and the top of iapt nc uh, welcome one and all and next i uh, welcome uh, our dynamic president dr ramesh babu to deliver a presidential address good evening all uh, respected uh, president 2021 dr ismail sir president elect dr suresh balan sir respected secretary dr rajendran sir rachader dr gopal sir and all the office bearers of iap tnsc vice president dr anamal vijayaraghavan sir eb members of central iap and iap tnsc for it's a great privilege for iap tnsc in organizing this uh, in hosting this cme on pediatric gastroenterology first of all i should thank the convener the chair persons and the moderator for uh, accepting this event in a short span of time now uh, i should really thank all the faculty as well as the moderators chair persons and the convener right from the convener dr ms vishwanath sir to the chair persons dr tangavel sir professor prc sir professor nirmala madam and dr varita janagraman madam and the moderator of the today's event professor maladi satyasagaran madam and the respected faculties dr neelam mohan madam dr surendra recha dr john mathai sir dr nishant wadwa and my senior dr parani ramana sir and dr shrish patnag sir i wish this please me to be a, a grand grand success uh, and i i am failing in my duty if i I to welcome all the delegates and post graduates who are watching today's event. This event is available both in Zoom as well as live in AAPD and as a YouTube channel. We have arranged CME credit hours from Tamil Nadu Medical Council for this event. I request all the participants to attend this program and uh, get benefited and to enrich their knowledge on gastroenterology and also to avail the credit hours. thank you for the opportunity over to dr rajendra thank you dr ramesh bab sir now i welcome today's program convener dr ms viswanathan sir to please state and we will start the program indian academy of pediatrics tamil nadu state branch good evening everyone and i would like to thank our visionary president dr ramesh babu our dynamic hard working secretary dr rajendra trustee dr gopal and our vice president uh, dr anamali vijayaraghavan our president immediate past president dr ismail and uh, president elect dr suresh balan as well as uh, the important man the technical person uh, triple a uh, dr thirumurgan sarain who was able to provide all the uh, technical support today and of course our uh, uh, friends dr dakshani amal raj and uh, yeah everyone please and also central eb members and state eb members and thank you very much dr rajendran sir for asking me to uh, to be a convener for this program and first of all i would like to say that you know we are able to get you know 
uh, our uh, past presidents and current president today. And we have uh, Professor Yacha, who is the, uh, I would say, I would say, godfather of our pioneer of pediatric gastroenterology in India. He uh, has kindly agreed to grace the occasion. And we have our own Professor uh, John Matai from Koyamuthur, and who is the immediate past president, and Dr. Nawadi Satyashegan, who has been a pillar of support, who has guided me, and she's here. And we have our dynamic current president, a charismatic lady, Dr. Neelam Morgan, is here, along with our secretary, Dr. Sirish Bhatnagar. And also I have my friend, Dr. Nishan Gadwa and Dr. Parne Raman as faculty. And uh, I hope I covered everyone. I don't, I hope I have not missed anyone. If not, if I miss someone uh, to, to become someone, please, um, yeah, my, my sorries and my apologies. And uh, I think we will start with the program soon. And uh, I think um, we are having two sessions. And uh, the first session will be chaired by uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Tangivel, sir, and Professor P. R. Ramachandra, sir. Uh, Professor Tangivel, sir, everybody knows about him. He has been a guide and teacher for many of us, actually. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can see you. Yeah. I uh, know. I mean, I mean, I, I'm just uh, putting up Dr. Uh, Tangivel, sir. Uh, uh, just want to see. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, so that. Sir, basically, you know, he's one of senior pediatrician from Tamil Nadu and he's a guide and mentor for many of us. He's doing a very difficult job of being a, the editor in chief of Indian Journal of Pre Practical Pediatrics. And, uh, and you know, the important credit goes to him is, you know, he started the diabetes clinic in ICH more than two decades when we had very little support from government. But now this is a full fledged clinic, it's doing very well. And many uh, people in the state, you uh, know, are taken. Uh, you know, this kind of um, uh, mentorship from Dr. Tangavil, sir, and they have done, they're doing very well, uh, the same diabetes clinic across the state. And he has been also a past instructor. He has many oration awards and also he's uh, our best teacher, not only for any particular period of time, over a period of decades, actually. And thank you very much, sir, for um, uh, agreeing to be a chairperson. And uh, one second is, uh, sorry, and uh, just on this uh, and we have next our Professor P. Ramachandran, sir, and who again was my teacher actually in ICH. And again, he's a teacher and mentor for many of us actually. And uh, he's currently based at Ramachandran Medical College, which is a deemed university. And he has a department there. And also, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. And uh, sir is, was the editor in chief of IJPP in 2014 to 2016. And he was a convener for IAP, HOD, and Professor Cell in, from 2013 to 2016. And he has his area of interest in critical care, infectious disease, and nutrition. And the SAR helps many of us in many ways. And thank you very much, sir, for agreeing to the chairperson for this session. And over to you now, and uh, thank you. And just want to say that uh, we have 20 minutes for each speakers and uh, 18 minutes for talk to men. Uh, please remain them at 18 minutes uh, so that they will finish by 20 minutes. And we have five minutes for discussion and also taking questions. Thank you. Over to chairpersons, Professor Tangavil and Professor P. Ramachandran. Good evening, uh, Professor PRC. Sir Dr. Ramachandran, sir. Good evening, uh, uh, my dear President Dr. Ramesh Babu. Rajendra Secretary, Dr. Kopal, Treasurer, Dr. Anamalai Vijayaran, Vice President, and all the senior teachers, Professor Srinivasan, Professor Yacha, and all the teaching faculty and moderators, uh, Professor Anamalai Vijayaraghavan, the Vice President. I'm very happy to be the chairperson for the next three important sessions. The first session is Obesity Associated Fatty Liver Disease in Children. This is a topic which is of interest both for the practitioners as well as for the academician, which is to be delivered by Dr. Neela Mohan. Second talk is on case scenarios of practitioners and diarrhea and constipation by Dr. Emma Swishanathan. It's a purely a topic of uh, general pediatricians. And the third one is a topic for the students and teaching faculties, neonatal cholestasis and approach for pediatrician, which is delivered none other than Professor Soyendra Yacha. With this, I also like to thank the organizers for, on behalf of myself and Dr. P. Ramachandran, thanking the organizers for giving us the opportunity. Uh, can I invite the first speaker, Dr. Neela Mohan, to deliver his talk? Pray to that. I just uh, 
Professor Neela Mohan, she is the currently, she is a director of Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Liver Transplantation, Medanda Medicity, Turgan. She has won many awards and achievements, including the B.C. Rai National Award from the President of India and uh, Distinguished National Board of Examination Teacher from National Board of Examinations. She is the President of many societies, very importantly, President of Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, and Commonwealth Association of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. She is a founder chairperson of Women Gapio, more than 800 presentations and 100 index publications, contributed to several national and international guidelines. With this, I invite uh, Dr. Neela Mohan to deliver her first talk on obesity related fatty liver disease, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tangevalu, for the kind introduction. I just would request the organizers to allow me to share the screen, please, because I was able to do it. Now it is saying that... Oh, you, can, you can start. You can start. You should be able to start. I'm doing it, but now it is not allowing because it's saying, yes, it is allowed now. Right. You can see, please. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So this talk uh, today is very interesting. What I've been asked to talk is... Yeah. So uh, the talk is on uh, obesity-associated fatty liver in children, is it naffled or maffled? And that's a very interesting uh, question that has been raised. Let me start with- I'm sorry to bother you. Yes. You're getting the replacement, uh, replace fonts, uh, uh, some screen uh, on the screen, ma'am. Can you just close it? Yeah. Is it seen now? It's yes, fine, no, it's okay now, it's fine. fine. So let me start with the case because I know I'm speaking to uh, uh, this talk is basically for the pediatricians. So this was a 14 year old boy who presented with pain abdomen for two weeks, which was uh, periumbilical intermittent dialing with some occasional vomiting. So he was being managed and there is no loose stool constipation, jaundice. So we managed with, with PPI on Densitron, but what was very interesting is that when we looked at his weight, it is 25th centile to 50th. Height was third to 10th centile. And his BMI was based on the height. It was showing as overweight. His vitals were normal. Clinically, his liver was four centimeter with a span of 13.5. There was no spleen. There was no clinical ascites. While he was being looked just for pain abdomen, you can say accidentally, we recognized that he had, uh, he also came with some investigations, his abnormal liver enzymes had come. So we looked at his investigations and from outside, in the last two months, he did have abnormal enzymes, 194 and 435. And then we repeated, as you can see, the liver enzyme was again high and ultrasound showed some hepatomegaly with fatty changes. His hemoglobin was 11.6, nothing else coming to RFT. Our uh, SGOT was also uh, 71 with an SGPT of 219 and a GGT of 134. So you've seen that we've had three abnormal readings that he has had of abnormal liver test. He was not obese, but we his endoscopy was done basically for pain abdomen and then he was given some supportive measures. But now the main question that I want to address to you all is how do I address this abnormal liver enzymes? Since it's been there for three months, the first thing that we start thinking is, uh, could it be some improving hepatitis, but his viral markers were negative. His, in North India, we also look for screening of celiac. His hemoglobin was on the lower side. So his TTG was normal and uh, his lipid profile thyroid was also normal. 
Often we do like to screen for Wilson's and autoimmune in such patients. So he was screened. And as you can see, his autoimmune workup was within the normal uh, limits. His Wilson's workup was again within the normal limits. So we try to rule out an underlying liver disease. And then very often in uh, our practice, we do fibro scan. And uh, the fibro scan is showing that the cap, which we call CAP, was increased. And for those who are non-gastroenterologists, basically we looked at two things. One is CAP cap and the other is the KPA, which is trying to give us an idea of fibrosis. Uh, of course, they are not 100% reliable, but they tend to pick up the uh, fibrosis, which is F2 and higher. And when it comes to CAP, what happens is there are different cutoffs, which I will take as I progress, but generally more than 240 in most studies, some say 210 and 240, we take it as abnormal. And you can see this was suggestive of a fatty liver disease. Now, so... The questions that let us ask ourselves, is this NAFL or fatty liver disease? This, of course, child is not obese. It is just a, a child with uh, overweight. And uh, what is NASH? Is all fatty liver in children NAFLD? Is the term NAFLD right? Is MAFLD, which is metabolic associated liver disease. Is that an appropriate term? What is the prevalence? If I assume that this definition is NAFL, what is its prevalence? How can this occur in children? What comorbidities to look for? How do you diagnose it? Do I need to do a biopsy in all? How do I treat it? These and will it progress to an adulthood? Let us try to answer these questions in the next 18 minutes or 15 minutes that would have been left by now. So NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is chronic hepatic steatosis. Some say, according to NASPGAN, we say 5%, but you'll find adult studies talking 10%. What you need to remember is there is evidence of macrovesicular steatosis with no evidence of viral, autoimmune, metabolic, infection, or drug-induced. So you have to rule out all this, just like we say in functional abdominal pain, room criteria, something like that. You rule out other infective inherited metabolic drugs, et cetera. Now, in most adults and children, NAFLD is associated with, I repeat, most. It is associated with central or generalized obesity, and often with insulin-resistant dyslipidemia, high triglyceride, et cetera. Now, what is NASH? NASH is the term where you will find inflammation. So the left side of the slide shows you white um, uh, cells, which are empty cells, which is the steatosis. And on the right side, you're seeing inflammatory dots, red dots in that inflammatory cells. So when you find inflammation, then we call it NASH which is the full form non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So is the terminology right and wrong is what I've been asked for. Now, the adults uh, did the meeting in 2020 and they, the international expert consensus uh, statement, which also included Dr. Sareen from India. And as you can see, it was a global uh, meeting and they feel that using FLD, which is metabolic associated fatty liver disease, seems more appropriate. And they proposed, is it NAFL to MAFL? Should it be a redefining moment for fatty liver disease? However, is all fatty liver in children NAFLD? Is all fatty liver in children uh, uh, metabolic associated? So we pediatricians need to understand that it's not alcohol, but it's also the cold beverages that we talk about. And this is the most important slide I would like to highlight that when I talk about fatty liver in children, it is 
for the pediatricians also to understand that all that you see fat in a child is not fatty liver disease or NAFID. Because as an expert, we need to rule out so many other causes in children. For example, let's look at the uh, GI or the nutritional causes, whether it is celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, malnutrition severe or anorexia nervosa, of course, obesity, we've been talking, type uh, one diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, and then the syndrome that we talk about, the polycystic and the other. Then even in conditions like Wilson's, autoimmune hepatitis, viral hepatitis, you might get uh, uh, fat, fatty liver if I just talk about between five to 10% too. The genetic causes and metabolic is very important for you to understand that these a beta lipoproteinemia, cholesterol ester, oxidation defects, citrine deficiency, stick fibrosis, glycogen storage disorder, hereditary fructose, mitochondrial disorders, fatty acid oxidation disorders, peroxysmal disorders, all that can give rise to fatty liver in children. What stops an obese child not to have some metabolic disorder, not to have some genetic disorder? So we've been talking of drugs and alcohol. Besides that, in children, you know, the anti-epileptic, Walpert, tetracycline, methotrexate, or steroids, and uh, these also can give rise to. So in children, the, uh, uh, the paper from London Dr. Anil Davan wanted to say, is it the right time to call it even metabolic associated, or should we limit ourselves to calling it as pediatric fatty liver disease? Because all is not NAFL, and pathophysiological insights are more important in children with an approach to management. And thus, though in adults, NAFL to NAFL was accepted, but the saga continues in children and we need an opportunity to advocate change. I would also like to uh, say that we need to be a bit cautious in labeling all into the trash bin of NAFL. All fatty liver, you see, do not, uh, there is a tendency not to investigate the normal liver enzyme. If you just find ultrasound fatty liver like in my patient or a fibroscan fatty liver. So I need not investigate or do we? So we need to understand we can't put everything into a uh, uh, trash bin. And the North Americans, some of them I spoke to, they feel that maybe leaving NAFLD is also right because the, can we call them N for nutrition? Nutrition associated fatty liver disease. However, for the purpose of simplicity, my further discussion in the talk, I am not going to give MAFLD or uh, this. I will restrict myself to NAFLD for purpose of easy communication between us. So what is this NAFLD, which I said was fatty liver without any underlying inherited metabolic genetic infective or other conditions? In that, while in the adults, it is as high as 25% in children too, we are recognizing almost as high as 10% global data is emerging on pediatric NAFL. But my dear colleagues, this may be an underestimation because there are limited studies. This is one beautiful paper which came in Nature, which is talking all about in various uh, countries, whether China, Iran, Australia, Brazil, USA, UK, we've been talking about. So one of the studies I want to highlight is USA, where based on liver histology, between two to 19 years, it was 13%. We all know liver histology is the gold standard. And of course, the rest, we look at liver enzyme raised two times normal. So ALT, majority of them show eight to 10%. And ultrasound, which has been looked uh, into is, uh, it varies, and I will now highlight some out of the Indian studies. So in Indian, in the Kashmir school, which was on a high cohort of more than 1,000 children, 
it was 7.4 prevalence in ultrasound. Whereas same thing in North India, in a North Indian Delhi school of urban school with again nearly 1000 showed 22.4%. So I think there is a difference in rural and urban, which is highlighted. If I look only into fatty uh, children, then globally it is 36. One in three fatty child will have fatty liver disease, NAFLD. And the data from uh, USA is also close to that. But in India, I would like to highlight our study, which was presented in the World Congress. We based on the ALT uh, was 30.8. So we took a cohort of 214 children who presented to the gastroenterology OPD with some like in this child coming to you with pain abdomen. So out of this 69% were obese were males and ALT raised more than two times normal was what we called as NAFL. And we took the same cutoff as USA 27, 23, which I'll highlight in my next slide was 30.8%. Uh, and uh, if I take five to 10 years, it was 36. And just look at 10 to 19 years, it was 64%. One in uh, two out of three obese kids were having fatty liver. So what did we do? Ultrasound was done in all of them. And uh, we uh, did miss 6%. They were reported as normal. Fibro scan in all, if I took the cutoff as 248, was picked up 100%, 240 we wanted to take. So that picked up 100%. And liver biopsy, of course, we can't do in all, and I'll tell you who to do, is was done in 20 out of them. And in that, uh, steatosis was 100%, and even fibrosis in children was as high as 15%. So this was our data, which is showing the biopsy slide and this. And then what causes uh, the NAFLD and fatty liver? We know about the primary hit theory where because of insulin resistant obesity, fat uh, accumulation, metabolic, hypercalorific diet, all for these reasons, the fat stores in the liver. And then the secondary hit factors could be your genetic or the environmental factors, maternal obesity, gestational diabetes, pre low, low birth weight. We have good data from India, which talks about small for gestation, low birth weight. And of course, the diet that we eat, the gut flora, the physical activity, all these acts like the secondary hit, and it gives rise to inflammation. What is inflammation? Cytokines and that. When there is inflammation, there will be scarring. So this is the second hit, which is called the NASH, and uh, that can give rise to fibrosis, then cirrhosis, then cancer. So earlier on, we thought it was only a disease of adults in 1980s, and it was late 1990s that the first uh, uh, NAFLD in children was actually report reported as late as 1996 or so. So remember that it, it's not a linear curve. You, I showed you that five to 10, it was uh, you know 30, and then I showed 64 percent. So it's not really a linear curve. Males, older age, ethnicity, like we Asians, or genetic factors, which these genes are available on us, more and twins, environmental factors, dietary, physical, and of course, the metabolic risk factors, these all give rise to predispose. Now there is emerging data on a gut microbiota and NAFLD. And you can see so many papers which are talking about how the gut microbiota influences the obesity and thus is it directly an effect of obesity or indirect also can give rise to inflammation. More work was done during COVID. I will take questions, but this is how uh, uh, this is the explained that uh, through the, uh, there is tight uh, junctions between the enterocyte, the healthy microbiota, it gives the protectiveness, but in the absence of healthy gut microbiota and dysbiosis, you can have the cytokine. And similar thing was seen during COVID and they also talked about fatty liver in patients uh, due to this cytokine surge. So the metabolic parameters, almost as high as 50% of pediatric uh, do show hyperinsulinism and 25% uh, hypertriglyceridemia. The Kashmir showed as high as 
54% had uh, metabolic syndrome in them. What is important to remember in children is not all that is fat is responsible, but what is very responsible is the fructose beverages that they take. So it's not the alcohol, but it's the sweetened fructose beverages, the fast food, the bad eating habits, missing breakfast, eating too much, late nights and eating too rapidly. All this have been shown in studies to be responsible for obesity and fatty liver disease. So how do you diagnose? One was clinically that you look at the weight, height, BMI, and the other is you look clinically, you look at the abdominal girth, then you look at acanthosis, migrants, and you look for some symptoms uh, of family history of syndrome and uh, hepatomegaly may be there. And the symptoms, majority of them may come to you asymptomatic, but you may, they may present to you uh, like irritability, fatigue, headaches. They could be all related actually to obesity and co-founding factors too. Trouble in concentrating, muscle cramps, depression. So these all could be, and a small proportion could come to the clinics with pain abdomen or vomiting or jaundice, something like that. So non-clinical diagnostic uh, modalities. I would have uh, looking at the liver enzymes, and then radiology, uh, uh, because of the short time, please understand, it is beyond the scope of me to cover everything. So you all can start giving comments and all, but my purpose is to cover the majority of the pediatricians to tell them and make life simple. So in radiology, ultrasound is good screening. The others, uh, you know, CT, MRI, elastography, it's just for studies. And then what are biomarkers clinical? We don't really use, I'll just talk about the word. Liver biopsy is the gold standard. So how do you screen? What is the NASPAGAN saying guidelines? There are ISPAGAN and NASPAGAN. Let me talk about NASPAGAN, which is North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology. So then really they say that from nine to 11 years with higher BMI or uh, uh, children with risk factors like obesity, insulin resistant, diabetes, dyslipidemia, sleep apnea, family history, NAFL, NASH, etc. These or less than young year, year uh, less than nine years younger patient with some risk factor like again obesity or family history or siblings of these and uh, they can also be included. So the cutoff they say is twenty two for girls and twenty six for boys as done it. USA studies, we don't have great data from India, what is the normal cuts. So they say that you can screen and then look every two to three years or earlier, depending on the need. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the England, the European guidelines, they are a little different. They believe that the high risk factors may be looked into more because what stop, stops them and they believe in aggressing, uh, investigating it more aggressively. Some questions people ask and lean people have. So my child was not really lean, but when you have a fatty liver in a lean, please understand there could be some genetic or metabolic and leave it for an expert. And from, from pediatrician's point of view, undernutrition cannot have normal weight and overweight can have. So do you need a biopsy for all? So the guideline is a little different. But as I said, if the enzymes are higher than two times normal, or in the ESPGAN guideline, they say that even without that, see, they have not talked about the enzyme, but they've talked about the family history, young age, hepatospinomegaly, and all the persistent transaminases, they are suggesting that you should go in for a biopsy when you look at that. So there are some changes in biopsy. You look, pediatric NASH is more showing portal inflammation that you see. So my patient coming back, so since the enzymes have been raised three times, we decided to go in with the liver biopsy. And the liver biopsy showed macrovascular steatosis 80% with uh, hepatocyte ballooning and even fibrosis. So this is uh, the, the this is how the report is given. They talk about you know it's not needed. Madam, to sorry to interrupt. I have only two more minutes, madam. The uh, organizers right. say that twenty minutes for the talk and five minutes for discussion. Okay. So this was another child, and that's how they get 
you know, eating during that time, they get obese. And then, so how do you manage? It is basically by diet and weight, main thing, exercises and all. There is no great role of arso deoxycholic acid. And this is the major <clears throat> thing. We have shown that 10% of weight loss can reverse the changes and more than 5% can reduce uh, steatosis, both in pediatric and adult studies. Stay away from processed food, encourage legumes, fruit, vegetable, nuts, seed, fish, oil. These are the good thing. Not greatly used in children with your experts and endocrinologists. We may use metformin in there. Vitamin E has been shown to reverse some changes in the biopsy. Otherwise, the main changes what we work in children is the diet when you exercise. And the new therapy that is available is uh, this obiticolic acid. Phase three trials in adults have shown great results and similar results in anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic. So coming back to my patient, the second patient, with the weight loss, his liver enzymes improved this patient 20 kgs. He lost over a period of six months. They can progress to cirrhosis and uh, uh, cancers in adults. So my dear colleagues, which we did not know earlier that so much. So this study says that in 20 years, there is 14% higher, 14 times higher risk of dying or needing a transplant. So dear colleagues, Obesity in children is becoming an epidemic worldwide. And in the pandemic era, we are facing more because they were in home. So NAFL or MAFL is increasing and contributing to pediatric liver disease. Should we call it PNAFL or nutrition or MAFL? I've talked. It is potentially reversible. If you want to cut the load of adults, cirrhosis, you have to work in children because we've shown that this is progressive. Indians, Asians have more chances and multifactorial things exist. Your responsibility as a pediatrician is to ensure to take a growth chart, a good diet history and encourage and give them advice about activity and diet. This is your window of opportunity to work. Thank you for your kind attention. Madam, thank you very much for finishing in time. We have three questions, madam. One is uh, from Dr. Jalil Ahmed asking, can NAFL leads to NASH later, NASH later? How can we predict? Can fibroscon have a role? NAFL yeah. leading to NASH. Yes. So, uh, NAFL leading to NASH, that is what I showed in the pathophysiology, that initially the same cohort of children, the same cohort of patients who have fatty liver, they, because of the secondary hit, they progress to uh, NASH. So maybe his question was put before I put. That's like, so the, the NAFL, when it continues, the, that progresses, this is the one I'm showing. That is the secondary hit, and that's how it gives rise to. This is multifactorial. This is what I'm saying, that it can be reversed. It can be prevented. So you may not be able to change some of your genetic factors, but you can look into the other factors, which is your diet, the blood flora, activity. So even though you have the metabolic factors, you need to work to prevent yourself from getting to secondary hit and NASH and fibrosis. Thank you, madam. Uh, next question from Ken Edinjalian. Can the fatty liver be associated with obesity without progressing to any other pathology in general? Yes. So a very good question. All uh, uh, NAFL do not progress to NASH and uh, cirrhosis. But it is seen from what we get experience from the adults that quite a lot, more than 30% of progress to uh, the, this is the question which he wants to ask. Yes, what's progression of NAFL? So we, there is positive of linear studies, but this study, which is a multi-centric uh, uh, study among biopsy proven PNAFL, they suggest 
that advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis was seen in a quarter at an 13 years of uh, progression. So this is what we are understanding. But what I want to impress is that it is not a linear curve. Just because it took 13 years to reach uh, to fibrosis in 24 doesn't mean. So the progression can go more rapid. So what in adults, the commonest liver disease now is what requires transplant in the Western country is not hepatitis B, C. Even in India now treatment is giving. So we find NAFLD associated or metabolic NAFLD associated cirrhosis as the cause for leading for transplant. So we, patients, we see patients as young as 40 and 50 years. So who are they? Now we understand that this is a progressive P NAFLD to a NAFLD. So this is the multicentric p uh, a biopsy proven study, which is stopped. And then the second retrospective long study of 20 years follow-up showed that they had 14 times, not 14%, 14 times high risk of dying or requiring a liver transplant than general population. Thank there you, are madam. The children last... who require transplant, even in children, 16 to 18 years, they needed transplant. And also post-liver transplant, there is a, a, a development of NAFL because of drugs and obesity and fatty liver. So post-transplant also, they differ, uh, develop NAFL. Thank you, madam. In the last question from Dr. Palni Raman, is it a diagnosis or exclusion in an asymptomatic child with hepatomegaly, but raised transaminases? Yes, so that is what I wanted uh, uh, the message to get clear that though we find in the ultrasound a fatty liver, you find an abnormal enzyme, it does not stop that child just because he's overweight and obese not to have a Wilson's or an autoimmune or anything else. So you must investigate for other causes before you just label it as fatty uh, liver or NAFL. So you saw in my first case, I did rule out autoimmune disease or uh, uh, a Wilson screen and then did a biopsy. But in my second case, who was very fat, I showed you a you know, BMI 32. That I did not do a biopsy sort of. There we worked, we looked at, we, we did the investigations, we treated and we followed up and saw that he is on follow-up. So you have to individualize and understand that all that is fat is not naffled also in children. But you have to also understand that 35% of the fat obese uh, children have NAFLD. So you need not miss NAFLD in them because if you do not work, like the, the mother who came the second time, that mother who saw that the biopsy is showing fibrosis, to you know, she was shaken up that, oh, it's like, so then you are able to communicate with the families and make them understand already liver is uh, getting damaged, you need to really work hard on it. And just, you know, they, they think, oh, it is only diet and exercise, what medication? So for them to understand this is, so we have shown that 10% reduction of weight can reverse your steatosis and even fibrosis and inflammation. So it's a reversible potential disease. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. I have some more questions you can answer in the chat box. I may request my... Uh co-panelist, uh, co-chairperson Dr. P. Ramchandran to introduce the next speaker and start the next uh, talk. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce, uh, am I audible? Audible, sir. Yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce one of the uh, very now, I should not say upcoming, he has already come up. Uh, Dr. Ramas Vishwanathan, he is a uh, uh, dear uh, friend and an esteemed colleague, now currently working in Apollo Children Hospital. He is a senior pediatric uh, gastroenterologist and hepatologist. And uh, he has got various uh, credits under his belt. He is now uh, as recognized as one of the reviewers for many of the uh, pediatric gastroenterology societies. 
and he has published recently some papers also which were in uh, very reputed journals and he is also uh, office bearer of uh, india academy of pediatrics uh, chennai city branch and uh, he is uh, recognized as an excellent teacher in uh, apollo children hospital currently he is working in apollo children hospital he will be talking to us about the clinical case scenarios in diarrhea and constipation over to dr m s sunathan thank you sir just stop the chat Uh, can you see my screen um, yes uh, can you hear me yes yes sir thank you thank you very much and thank you sir for the kind introduction and uh, the 20 minutes starts for me from now uh, okay and i to wish for not i just wanted to uh, say thank you i may have to leave in between so thank you for the host for this opportunity thank you neelam thank you very for uh, for uh, giving a nice talk on fatty liver disease so i'll be talking on case scenarios 20 minutes starts from now and uh, basically uh, just the first scenario is uh, uh, basically a 20 days old baby you come up this is very commonly you know with this kind of uh, perianal excoriated skin and basically this baby was breastfed exclusively and the good birth weight and having stools of around 7 to 8 times a day with a bit of a greenish stools no mucus or no blood now the child's weight is reasonably okay 3.6 kg so what's the diagnosis i will out in track but unfortunately the webinar doesn't allow that so basically you have a newborn with a perianal excretion who is on exclusively breastfeed so basically here you're dealing with the transient lactose intolerance likely due to you know being this baby being fed too much of whole milk rather than the high milk so we have to ensure the little one gets more of the high milk and probably you can apply the uh, barrier cream like zinc based creams topically so what is this you know whole milk high milk imbalance you all know that whole milk has got less of fat and whereas high milk has got more of fat so how this imbalance can happen basically this ham imbalance happens because of consumption of large amounts of low fat milk this could be due to over supply of milk because there has been increased length of time between feeds causing the mother's breast to overfill predominantly with whole milk and the thing is switching uh, between breast without actually draining one properly during feeding sessions so apart from this you know lactose intolerance happens in newborn we all know that the secondary lactose intolerance is very common following diarrheal episodes and also we know that in preterms they can have bit of a developmental lactase deficiency which results over a period of time and you know i just want to point out to all the audience that the congenital lactase deficiency is very rare okay what happens actually in lactose when it goes to small intestine it breaks down by, it is broken down by the lactase which is in the breast border to glucose and galactose and uh, what happens is lactose intolerance this process doesn't happen for various reasons the lactose goes into the large bowel where the bacteria the ferments them into ga gas predominantly methane and acids and which goes into the stools and uh, results in excoriation there and they can result in flatulence and abdominal pain etc so you have to remember that adult onset lactose intolerance is also there uh, commonly you have to remember that on a global scale the persistence of the ability to digest lactose actually is an exception so the the, the possibility of a lactose that the lactase in, enzyme deficiency is relatively common in the adult population across different parts of the world so what is the therapy for lactose intolerance obviously this is i'm talking about beyond a, a breastfeeding age group you know i'm talking about you know child who is being predominantly complementary fed or some other feeds so basically go for a lack low lactose diet and then if there has been no response after one week then you go for lactose free diet at least for a period of 3 weeks if you are very sure you are dealing with lactose intolerance so i just always highlight you know still some people get confused between lactose intolerance and milk allergy we have to remember that lactose intolerance is basically enzyme deficiency it affects only gi tract whereas milk protein allergy is an immunologically driven process 
wherein there is more than one system involved. Apart from GI, usually you have skin or the respiratory tract involvement. The diagnosis is mainly by cow's milk protein elimination and re-challenge. And here you don't give any daily products as a therapy. And then most of them recovered by one to three or of age. And usually the exclusive breastfeeding till six months of age does prevent milk allergy in majority of the cases. That scenario two, you have a child here, the perianal rash, and also this child, you know, had a 11 month old who had pneumonia treated with oral antibiotics, <coughs> followed by diarrhea for at least for 12 days and noted to have perianal rash. And you can see the other one, this is much more well depicted here. You can see a significant erythema there with satellite lesion. Basically, what we are seeing here is a perianal erythema and the satellite lesions occurring at the flexures, as you can see in the thick, curdy lesions around the, uh, the folds. And then also, you know, you can have a raw area. And also, when you have this kind of uh, feature, you also think about basically a fungal infection. Look at the oral cavity and you find an oral thrush. So basically, this is a fungal infection. And because this is happening because probably due to the antibiotic exposure the child had, you can uh, take a uh, swab and then you can do the culture. And it's usually the candida albicans. And as I mentioned earlier, it is usually following courses of antibiotics. And sometimes you may come across an immune deficient child. The treatment is a topical nystatin for old thrush and systemically fluconosol for a period of one week. And how do you differentiate a candidial rash from a diaper rash? As I mentioned earlier, fungal rash usually, you know, has a satellite lesions. They may have an associated oral thrush and they occur in the folds of legs, genitals, or buttocks. And very importantly, they do not respond to the standard diaper barrier creams. Whereas the regular diaper rash do respond well to the diaper creams. And usually they are localized to one area and they do not have the oral thrush. So what is important is, you know, as far as uh, the IAP says, you know, <clears throat> rational antibiotic use, we have to make sure we use antibiotics judicially in diarrhea to avoid fungal or super added bacterial infection. This, what, when, when you can use antibiotics in diarrhea, when there's a dysentery as in shigella or in cholera or in MTB by stoltica, where you can use metronidazole or nitroxazonide in cryptosporidium, or you could use broad spectrum antibiotics when there is an immune deficiency state. The, sec the, the third case is, you know, a two-year-old child who took it to me with, you know, two days history of blue stools, some mucus, no blood. Otherwise, no significant history in the past. He has seen local pharmacists, they are given a special rehydration fluid. When I saw the child was looking lethargic with some dehydration. So I was asking exactly what exactly they are given as part of rehydration regimen. This is what they showed. It is ORSL. And this is basically an enrich with electrolytes and vitamin C, etc. This is how they have been marketed. So basically, it's being sold in singular tetra packs. Many pharmacists keep them. A major pharma actually manufactures this as a sport drink. And unfortunately, inadvertently, many of the pharmacists do sell them to correct dehydration due to diarrhea. <coughs> and this is appealing when they see that, you know, they have to just be a <coughs> juice. So what is exactly is ORSL and ORSL plus? Basically, they have this bit of electrolytes. Along with that, they have vitamin C in both of them, 20 milligram. <coughs> and then in ORSL plus, you have additional minerals like magnesium and calcium in addition to whatever it is in ORSL. How does this differ uh, compared to a low or smaller standard ORS. You know that on the left-hand side, you have the ORS standard one, wherein you have the glucose of 75 millimole per liter, giving an osmolality of 245. Whereas in ORS L and L plus, you have an osmolality of nearly 590. And this is due to mainly to the predominant glucose standard of nearly 4 <laughs> millimole per liter. So basically what's happening, this is one of the article in one of the magazine, uh, just J and J, you know, the J Johnson Johnson, basically the apple drink is being confused for a WHO recommended or a solution. As clearly mentioned here, the total osmolality is one is 585 or a cell, whereas only 0245 or as what does it mean when somebody gives this one, the child can have hypernatremia or they can, they, they can osmotic diarrhea. So WHO does state that 
a clear distinction should be made between products recommended for treating or preventing dehydration caused by <clears throat> diarrhea as against sport drinks because they are potentially dangerous to be used in diarrheal dehydration correction as they can cause osmotic diarrhea and hypernatremia. So what is happening in India as far as diarrhea is concerned? <coughs> India, in, in India, uh, diarrhea is the third leading, leading cause of mortality, particularly in under fights, around 9% of the deaths are due to diarrhea. This is the data from 2015. The UNICEF data from 2019 does say that around approximately 7% of under five mortality is due to diarrhea. What is our National Family Health Service a recent survey says that, you know, basically what the treatment of childhood diseases, if you look at the number 69, you know that NHS of five, the total, you know, the prevalence of diarrhea is approximately 8%. But unfortunately, only 60% is are using ORS and only 30% are using zinc. What's happening in Tamil Nadu? We are though the under five mortality rate is less compared to other parts of the country. Unfortunately, the diet, the ORS usage is only 54% and the zinc usage is only 30%. So we are still far behind in using ORS and zinc adequately. And we should avoid using this ORSL. So what is persistent diarrhea? Persistent diarrhea, any diarrhea which is lasting more than 14 days, the acute onset and following infective etiology. We are not discussing anything about chronic diarrhea in persistent diarrhea. So this could be due to secondary lactose intolerance, as in our case, or a fungal superinfection or multiple antibiotic associated diarrhea, or it could be in systemic sepsis, or it could be due to an underlying malnutrition and enteropathy. The risk factors, apart from what I have discussed, can this also include you know, early introduction of animal milk and reduced intake of breast milk, apart from malnutrition. The risk of death include any child having severe dehydration, particularly if they are less than six months of age and they have an associated systemic sepsis or a total pantry nutrition being used for other reasons. So we should not forget rotavirus vaccines in prevention of diarrhea. That's very important. However, we do see more of astrovirus diarrhea nowadays. And chronic diarrhea, little two slides about chronic diarrhea. If this you see it's a chronic diarrhea, if the diarrhea lasts more than four weeks, usually, and in, in infancy, this, this can be intractable, can lead to dependence on parental nutrition. There are many causes of chronic diarrhea. The acute cause include again the viruses or it could be a cow's milk protein allergy, or it could be necrotizing enterocolitis of prematurity, or it could be medications. Congenital includes many, apart from intestinal abnormalities, it includes various genetic conditions, what we call as congenital diarrhea and enteropathies. We don't have time to discuss them. Chronic diarrhea, basically you can categorize them and their electrolyte transport related diarrhea, which used to be called secretary, the appropriate term will be electrolyte transport related and similarly diet related diarrhea as against osmotic diarrhea. Fatty diarrhea can be a steatoria as in uh, maldigestion in, in, in the intestine or due to pancreatic insufficiency. Inflammatory, you know, is due to inflammatory causes like uh, IBD. So treatment goals is basically you treat the underlying etiology, prevent the complication, address the rehabilitation. So, but you can, you have got nice references from our respect and colleagues, Dr. John Mata has given a nice article on chronic diarrhea. And also we have given as a SPAGAN group, we have given a guideline on therapeutic intern formulas, which, can, which states you can use. You know, we are, it is a very nice article you can uh, just publish a couple of years ago. And also we have got a guideline on post-mill protein allergy from Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology Group. So this scenario, this going forward, you know, this is a 14 year old child kind of came from Thiruvannamalai, both the parents are police. This child had pain for three months with vomiting and soiling in pants for three months with irregular stooling. So what's happening here is also, he was bullied at school because he was having soiling, the, no children wants to sit nearby and he, they were saying this is a false smelling boy and so he didn't want to go to school. So he was withdrawn with a good anthropometry. Obviously, there is a mild tendency to left iliac force and fecal mass. I did see significant fecal soiling, even in a 14-year-old boy. Other system examination was unremarkable. So basically, here if you have a child, a teenage boy with a chronic constipation fecal impaction. He has got overflow incontinence, he got psychological issues. Okay, I did a disinfection over a period of one week, and then the soiling got better, and I was able to attend school full time and cheerful now. 
Another child is four year old with abdominal discomfort for four months. He came, he came from one of the uh, northern east, northeastern part of the country. He was having constipation and decreased appetite. But he was also treated with anti epileptics for fix for the last two months. So, on examination, again, his anthropology is okay, with some discomfort. He did have a significant tenderness and uh, over the left lumbar and left iliac region and with a, what to say, a fecal mass. The father did show me a video of so called fish. I couldn't upload here because of lack of time, but I can say that basically the child was crisscrossing the legs and rolling on the floor. And this he was to doing in the standing posture also as per the dad. So basically, this is a stool withholding posture. Actually, the neurology opinion did agree with me. This is not at all seizures. We stopped the anti epileptics, and there was no further issues as far as seizures is concerned. So here we have a child who was diagnosed as uh, seizures as we were looking at the stool withholding portion. Unfortunately, but the child actually had chronic constipation, fecal impaction. This is another scenario <coughs> where we have a two-year-old boy. Both the parents are professional. One of them actually was a surgeon, another one was a dentist. And a discomfort, abdominal discomfort for one, four weeks nearly, intermittent vomiting, and they were saying he was passing frequent stool six to eight per day. But he had some fever initially. So they were worried about surgical causes and they have evaluated that at local hospital. So basically going back to the details, you know, basically he had constipation in the past. What they are saying is this frequency was actually frequent small volume hard stool, and it was not loose stools at all. And basically they were given antispasmodic and anti diarrheas for this. So, and again, he is that very clear evidence of uh, constipation. Upon parents, instance, I have to do an ultrasound through a surgical cause. And I was telling them very clearly that apart from loaded colon, nothing else was there. So basically, you have a child with fecal impaction, and there's a disruption in family dynamics. Mom and dad will not sleep in the night. Mom used to call daddy who was an on-call in surgery department. So constipation acute is less than two weeks. More than two weeks is chronic. And epidemiology, you know, it can be, you know, as high as 15% prevalence in many parts of the world. Functional constipation is a much more common one. More than 90% happens beyond the neonatal period. We have Rome Foundation who gives a criteria and basically two uh, for less than four years and more than four years. And they have got five criteria. If any two there, then you diagnose if they are being there for at least one month duration. If they have got two or fewer defecations per week or excessive stool retention, hard stools, large diameter stools, a large fecal mass in the rectum. And more than four years, similar criteria. Again, we can have an history of a return to posturing. Again, the, the duration has to be there for one month. You can use a Bristol stool chart, but again, this is very useful in children. You know, you got just only five types. Type one and type two are very hard stools. Type three is reasonably, that's a normal soft stools. Type four and five semi-solid to slow stools. These are the various tool withholding postures I was talking about. If you ask a question, if your parent says that my child is trying very hard to pass the stool, we can say that very clearly that your child is trying very hard not to pass the stool and the diagnosis of constipation is confirmed. Okay, when it is likely to occur, so change in the fees, change in the nursery, change in the school or during travel. Most constipation start acutely and hence it is very important to recognize and treat very early. So what are the alarm symptoms? They, it's starting very early on life with the delayed passage of meconium, failure to thrive, with developmental delay, or any sort of fever or bilious obstruction and vomiting. Severe abdominal distension or abnormal position of ANS or neurological issues or a tough tough hair or sacral, you know, uh, cleft, anything, you have to be worried about, you know, an underlying organic etiology. People are always worried about Moshe Hirschsprung. Hirschsprung usually present very early on life. There may be a history of delayed passage of meconium, retenting posturing, or fecal soiling, or large caliber stools are not seen here. And you have a tight, empty rectum. And on barium minima, you have a narrow segment with proximal dilatation. Whereas in functional constipation, usually it presents beyond the neonatal period and the, the, the normal growth and development and the large diameter uh, caliber stools, pickle soiling and rejecting portions is very common and barium minima does not show any transition zone. Consequences, decreased appetite very commonly, non-specific pain much more common, fecal soiling, rectal bleeding, voiding, dysfunction is very common, enuresis, school absenteeism as in our case. 
Comorbidities include iron deficiency anemia. They can be associated very commonly with obesity. UTI is common and psychological issues. Management, apart from you know, we looking at all the five components have to be addressed. Diet, you know, you can approximate idea the fiber requirement will be age in years plus five. Importantly, ask them to cut down the milk, high salt and high sugar and high fat diet and also refined flour. Fiber can kind of approximately, this kind of fruit will give you two to three gram of fiber. A much larger fruit will give you four to six gram of fiber and 50 gram of green leafy vegetable will give around four gram of fiber. Medications, you all know that's osmotic laxatives and stimulants are there. The principles are polyethylene glycol, the first line maintenance treatment, lactose as the first line you can use if the peg is being not tolerated or unsuitable in small babies or infants. Addition of any mass is actually not needed. If disinfection needed, you give it an adequate dose over five to six days. Stimulant laxatives, if needed, do involve a specialist. And maintenance treatment continue for a minimum three months. Do not stop the maintenance treatment while the child is being toilet trained. So lactose dose is one to three, two gram per kilo. Remember that they can cause abdominal cramps and fat glands. Polyethylene glycol maintenance is approximately 0.5 gram per kilo per day, but it is up to 1.5 gram for disinfection. Mineral oil preferably not to be used in infants to the risk of aspiration. These are the various other laxatives and doses. And we also have a guideline from Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology Constipation published two years ago. You can look at that. So the take home messages for the diarrhea in lactose intolerance, a lactose free diet for 21 days. Post milk protein allergies diagnosed by milk elimination and re challenge. Use antibiotics judicially to, to avoid fungal infection. ORSL. Please do not use in diarrhea and dehydration management. Involve pediatric gastroenterology very early in chronic diarrhea. For functional constipation, identify the underlying disease with the alarm symptoms and signs. Look for fecal impaction and treat it adequately. The preferred laxative is polyethylene glycol. Avoid rectal preparation nowadays. We don't need them actually. The key for success is maintenance treatment, regular follow-up and education. And that's my contact details if you've got any queries. And I'd like to thank all my teachers and the parents and the uh, children whom I learned from uh, my alma mater, ICH Chennai, and also from overseas training in Birmingham and London Great Ormond Street and King's College. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishwanathan. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat box. Yes, sir. Uh, by Dr. Nadinjalian. The first question he has put up uh, is uh, uh, regarding the rice based ORS. Is there any role for using the super ORS in the current situations? Not, sir. Not, not needed now as of now. The only thing, if at all, you need is individual special ORS, is this small all in severe malnutrition. Otherwise, you know, the whatever the ORS are currently available in our country is very well, you know, we can use that, that's enough. Uh, he has also asked another question regarding the, uh, the children not liking the ORS. Uh, <laughs> so many times they don't like. So uh, how do you make them take? So he has <laughs> said that uh, unless the child is dehydrated, uh, especially not dehydrated, the child uh, doesn't like. How to I'm overcome this? I'm sure Dr. Narendra will have a lot of uh, tricks in this uh, area. But anyhow, I think usually we recommend the, the powder-based ORS to mix in 200 ml of water, a small sachet or a big sachet to mix in one liter of water. Sometimes there are available as flavors, or some flavored ORS is fine. And also I have seen some you know, ready-made ORS is available. Some are actually WHO compliant. You can use them. It's not everything is ORS L. Some of them are available as, you know, uh, basically a WHO complaint is there. You can use them. And uh, basically the trick is actually you give them in very small volume, 5 to 10 ml. That's the main thing. And I'm sure if you give that, they will be able to tolerate rather than give a big volume. Dr. Vishnathan, can I make a comment? Yes, sir, please. I think if the mother says, I've been giving ORS, my child takes it very well. Most likely it is not WHO ORS. <laughs> okay, so uh, please uh, look into it. Okay, yeah. many times they, you may not. Uh, sometimes you may miss it. The war is yellow. Okay, so generally uh, it is very well known that sugar content is less. So as uh, rightly said by Dr. Narendrajian, the basic indication is when the child is going to some kind of a dehydration. That is the point of time children like to actually oh. start taking waters. Okay. Otherwise, most of the time we can get away with uh, homemade uh, fluids. 
okay with uh, uh, just a normal uh, diet and uh, breastfeeding children there is no problem so majority of the time we may not require uh, who ors in most of our routine uh, uh, outpatient cases in our uh, practice <clears throat> yes maybe in the hospital practice in another social status sometimes they may require and this is my comment is there dr chalam is showing her hand ma'am do you want to make any comment okay uh, thank you ma'am dr jalil we'll come to you later uh, are there any other uh, questions can i ask you one more question dr vishnathan yes sir when yeah. do you as far as the breastfeeding is concerned there is no problem but when the child is on uh, some other milk let us say one year or one and a half year the child has diarrhea <clears throat> do you recommend the parents to stop milk up front as a part of a dietary management of no, no. just two or three days of diarrhea mm. what i'm asking is it all it all depends upon what we find on clinical examination also obviously if you have any evidence of lactose intolerance then probably <clears throat> you may have to stop but if there is not there then i don't think you have to because if, if the main uh, intake for the child is you know uh, milk or nothing else i don't think we have to rush and do that but if you think there is a very clear evidence of uh, secondary lactose intolerance then you may be told for few days otherwise i don't think so but probably you can give a lesser volume i don't think we need to re- literally ask them to do that unless you strongly suspect a milk allergy in such scenario the, 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 you know you have to definitely eliminate and see so probably uh, because you are uh, three days can i make a comment secondary la- yeah ma'am please go ahead ma'am see when you Vishnu, say when is it uh, uh, is it okay do we have time for that you please uh, tell us yeah i think so i don't know about that sure. The yes, homemade ma'am. ORS. We have to be very sure the mother understood how to make the homemade ORS because I have known cases where the mother put a lot of salt and the child developed severe hypernatremia. This is this happened in CMC. John Mathai might remember that patient, uh, that child. Uh, ma'am, I was so not referring to, to homemade ORS. Homemade fluids. Uh, homemade fluids. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Homemade fluids are. different okay thank you madam thank you yeah uh, dr jalil is there any question please ask otherwise uh... so, oh, i'll take only one less than a minute to dr mishra then can you make comment on the low lactose diet please uh, very good question i'll talk to you a bit later sir we have to move to the next session i'll talk to you thank you <clears throat> good evening um, i'm very happy to introduce a third speaker and third talk when he was a student neonatal cholestatic syndrome was a good interesting case for the exam under the t- teaching from dr maldi satyashekar and professor vs and baskar raj we very really, really happily we will uh, be ready to face the examiner when i became a general pediatrician i found it very stressful when i would see a child with neonatal cholestasis even with the support of a pediatric gastroenterologist very difficult because lot of investigations counseling the parents very difficult i am going to tell a lot of negative things it will become really stressed up now to explain the approach towards the neonatal cholestasis we have the father of pediatric gastroenterology in india dr surendra k yacha he is the uh, he was a director and head of pediatric gastroenterology hepatology and liver transplantation in sakra world hospital bangalore his major achievement not only for him for india is he developed a pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology in india first department and first dm pediatric gastro course in india was started by him all of us are inducted to use not only gastroenterologists everybody numerous awards 93 awards and honors 595 lectures amazing his publications are 250 peer reviewed including pubmed book chapters and that book chapters in 32 with this i invite uh, professor yacha to deliver his uh, talk on neonatal cholestasis syndrome <clears throat> respected chairpersons dignitaries of uh, tamil nadu iip my fellow pediatric gastroenterology <laughs> faculty members on the panel i am in assigned this topic state of the state for all these years 20 25 years I have been invited by many of the societies to talk on this on this topic. It is difficult, as the chairman said, but uh, what we can do is that. Uh, 
happening. Okay. Can you see the slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are able to see the slides. Right, right. So what is happening? Actually, we have gained a lot of milestones in the last 20 years, but a big problem, stumbling block, which we are observing is the referral of these patients. Secondly, probably there is also a component of confusion as far as the investigations are concerned. People read the textbooks or the journals and they get confused. What we have to concentrate on is the Indian scenario in particular. Secondly, we should concentrate on major disorders. We should not look at the real disorders and start looking for them in the beginning. That is not a re real trend. So here, when any, any child, the concept is any child who has jaundice and has passage of dark urine, which is staining the diapers with or without pale stool or acolytic stool is cholestasis. This is the definition. If, those, if the uh, pediatricians understand any baby in the first year, month of life, they generally have got unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and it may get confused with that. Jaundice with staining of the diapers, always the liver disease is there. Now what happens? There are two major categories. One is the biliary category and another is the intrahepatic category. And they all look alike from outside many a times. And therefore the confusion, what should I do as a doctor? So, last 10 years, a lot of new things have come in neonatal cholestasis, world war, screening, diagnosis, outcome, therapy, and a lot of uh, metabolics, genomics, basic sciences have emerged. But I will talk about the basic things which are required by a pediatrician. Now, this is the spectrum of neonatal cholestasis in India. This is just a general overview. It is published in 2000, and you can see here, broadly you have biliary atresia, 34%. You have got uh, hepatocellular causes, 53%, and other causes. Now, let us see here. Just to bifurcate further, general picture is like this in India. Mostly you will find in intrahepatic idiopathic neonatal hepatitis, galactosemia as a metabolic disorder, neonatal sepsis, allegedly syndrome, intrauterine infections, although very rare and too much of emphasis by the pediatrician for the disorder, PFIC is progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis and tyrosine. See, these are the major disorders for intrahepatic category. The rest we should forget. Second thing is the biliary where 95%, 95% of the cases will be biliary atresia, only 5% will be cholodocal cyst. Not difficult, cholodocal cyst, not difficult to be diagnosed, simple ultrasound, a good radiologist can easily diagnose this condition. This is the definition of neonatal liver failure. As of now, we should remember any INR which is not correctable and more than three should be taken as acute liver failure. And some people take more than two without encephalopathy as pediatric acute liver failure. Now here, this is the real picture I'm telling. These are the real photographs and real cases. What I'm going to show you, this is a rapid, in children, in babies, particularly infants, the liver disease is very fast progressive. And small, a child who has got two, two months, three months liver disease can go into cirrhosis very fast, can develop a full flash picture of chronic liver disease like abdominal veins, ascites, hard liver, and so on can happen in these children. Therefore, these disorders have to be recognized very fast in our uh, clinical practice. This is the consensus which was developed in, uh, by me and my group in uh, 2000 published. And thereafter, you can see the posters which were awareness posters which were created and uh, started at Hyderabad. And then you can see another consensus coming in 2014 from Apollo Group and uh, Pediatric Gastroenterology uh, Chapter. And so many endeavors have been actually done 
to create an awareness on the disorder. Now this is recent. What we have, I have created a card for India. We have a Taiwan card, everybody is talking. See about Taiwan card. And uh, this is a published study now. Here why I did one more thing, which is more important. That was the urine color. If the staining of the urine of the diapers is dark yellow, it is really a liver disease. And then you look at these two colors, that's the different, that's the easier thing than recognizing first the liver disorder. What I do? In my practice, why any child who has jaundice, a lot of children come to me, they have got dark urine. I ask this question, is it staining the diapers? Staining the diapers repeatedly. And if it is staining the liver disease, then what do you do? You look at the uh, serum bilirubin. Is it conjugated? Yes. And give vitamin K. Don't forget to give vitamin K irrespective of not doing any investigation in the child because they are prone to bleeding. Now, this is stool color. This is the urine color card. And you can see, go here. Next is liver function test. So simply you look at the stool color. You look at the urine color and childly jaundice and liver function test. There is no way it cannot discriminate intrahepatic from the biliary causes. Biliary atresia or intrahepatic cause cannot be discriminated by liver function test, except we may get some clues. Any child who has got high gamma GT may indicate biliary atresia. And low gamma GT distinctly will show biological synthesis defect. Don't forget the very rare disorder, biological synthesis defect. So look for gamma GT. It should be inclusive of liver function test in any investigative or maternity. Not to forget give vitamin uh, which will fat soluble and water soluble vitamins. Now what do I do? General clinical condition. If the patient generally you will find majority 90% of cholestasis are not sick babies. They are very good. They are active. They are sucking well. They are uh, taking the feeds. But what is happening? There may be situation where you may get around 10% who are sick babies. They will have fever, vesicle, rash, anemia, sepsis, or any baby with small for date, low birth weight baby, if deaths are their history, maternal adverse factors may be there. So this I consider in my own evaluation and write-ups. I say that they are sick patients. If you get sip deaths in any uh, child earlier, they should be considered as sick children. And not sick will be simple two categories, pale stool or pigmented stool. Generally, this group, sick children, will have got pigmented stools. Now, these are the things which you look in sick babies, they may have seizures, hypoglycemia, uncorrectable coagulopathy, ascites, recurrent and early sleep deaths, maternal history of stillbirth, abortion, pruritus, lethargy, poor feeding, and anemia, fever. So this is a sick baby definition. This you should look for. If the child is not doing well, look for these things. Now I will show you some of the cases. So up to this point, high colored urine, staining the diapers, jaundice baby, cholestasis. Second point, look at the stool, yellow or pigmented. Uh, pigmented or it is a clay colored stool that is a uh, white stool that you should see for yourself, not leave it to the mother. And today, world is having the photography mobile you can see and ask them to send you or see for yourself or record these two colors so any baby with these things think of neonatal quality so far it is not difficult lfts are not making any distinction look for gamma gt that's all now second i will just show you on illustrative cases jaundice from third day of life Persistently pale stool, diaper staining of urine, so cholestasis, not a sick baby, low birth weight, liver spleen palpable. And uh, possibility here is biliary atresia because majority, almost 99.9% .9 of biliary atresia will have pale stools.
and conjugated jaundice. Gamma GT very high, ultrasound showing rudimentary gallbladder, triangular card sign, and no cyst or intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation. I would advise all pediatricians, you should write what you want from the radiologist in this baby. They are mostly tuned to the other uh, hepatobiliary systems, but for the babies, you have to train them, you have to tune them to looking at these things. So this child underwent liver biopsy. Liver biopsy, again, we have to tune the pathologist for the pediatric liver disorders, ductular proliferation, fibrosis, and early surgery was biliary. So this case was a biliary atresia. Pale stool, not sick child, ultrasound features, biopsy. So I have not used torch. I have not used the nuclear scan. I have not used anything else to investigate and uh, complete this child. Confirm, Kazai is potatromacy done, follow up very good. And uh, you can see what is ultrasonography. Ask well, what is the size of the gallbladder? Is it contractile on feeding or not? That means two stage ultrasound has to be done. One is fasting, another is post feed. You have to see how much contractility has taken place. Triangular card sign is nothing but a fibrotic band at porta. Cyst porta is a cyst which may be seen in biliary atresia patient. So this is what is an ultrasound. The rest of the things we are not really concerned. Uh, like what the, the hepatic vein, this vein, that vein, that we are not concerned. No mass lesion. That is what they write. So, cholangiogram is the gold standard. Most of the time, the question is every pediatrician, most of them, they have this mindset of getting the scintigraphy, nuclear scintigraphy, nuclear scan. Nuclear scan message, very clear message. Nuclear scan is used for exclusion of biliary atresia. It is not for diagnosing biliary atresia. If you see the excretion of the uh, technician in the small bowel, it shows that biliary atresia is not there. You are very sure 100% yes it is not there, so we are not to follow that track of treatment of biliary atresia. If you don't find, doesn't mean that this is biliary atresia only. So many uh, surgeons I have seen, they do nuclear scan and excretion is, excretion is not there and they will open up and there will be a negative laparotomy. So another point which I want to draw to the attention of the pediatricians is you have a preterm baby and <clears throat> never understand as of now, today, that preterm babies can also have biliary atresia. Generally, pale stools can occur in pre preterm babies because of many factors. But if it is persistently pale and there are some adversities on ultrasound, then we should think of biliary atresia also in preterm babies. This is a time one study. We showed a higher incidence of actually biliary atresia in preterm babies and sensitivity of looking at stools is equally good in preterm vis-a-vis -vis the term babies. Another chart, though so biliary atresia, I have not done any, any other investigation except the three investigations which I uh, looked for and described. Now another child who has got jaundice with pigmented stool, day 10 of life, stormy course, seizures, and this child at day 30 came to us. And here, what we can see, this is a sick child. This is a stormy course. So they and jaundice and high colored urine. Stool is pigmented. So there is some other reason for this. It may be actually metabolic disease. And when you look for this, bilirubin is conjugated. Albumin is low, protein is low. And INR, prothrombin time, is not correctable despite three doses of vitamin K. And Ultrasound is normal. It's not showing anything. No cord sign, no cyst, no contractility of the gallbladder is very good. And what we did, non-glucose reducing substances in urine. We did a gallop, uh, galactose one phosphate transferase, which was low. This is confirmatory of galactosemia. 
alpha beta protein is done as a screening for what is called tyrosinemia which is normal peritin is done as a screening for congenital hemochromatosis which is normal and we had also done tor because this was sick child eye examination was normal and blood culture showed sepsis that is clepsila so what is here the child has galactosemia so sick child with seizures stormy course culture positivity so any child who has got culture positivity in your infancy particularly in first month of life so don't think only of sepsis there may be something underlying and in a jaundice patient think of galactosemia management was because he was put on galactose free diet everything settled and you can see here uh, the child had become on follow up absolutely normal and we have recently we have also published 2 3 years back a series of galactosemia in children in indian pediatrics which attracted the editorials two editorials actually from the journal here another child there is pale stool jaundice and but since 2 months of age diaper staining of urine and slightly late pruritus at 5 months of age birth weight and weight gain poor uh, and there was isolated mild gross motor delay in this child so here is a pale stool the onset is at 2 months so you may think of bilir at least yeah, but what has happened retrospectively when you see there is pruritus at 5 months of age pruritus generally will not manifest even if it is present before 3 months of age itching what we call after that is the developed in the child and therefore this might be because of different reason like allegheny syndrome progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis you remember just two condition positive allegheny syndrome and pfic progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis these two can rest you forget and you can you can see all the dysmorphism can be seen uh, liver palpable cardiovascular system you can see systolic murmur and this patient has normal ultrasound gamma gt is normal slightly elevated conjugated bilirubin then you see here vertical changes trigles right cell peripheral pulmonic stenosis on echo and this child we underwent liver biopsy we showed positive of interlobular bile ducts and with all the features together we can say this patient has got what's called allegheny syndrome so he was put management here is more of quality of life that is pruritus manage with edca and rapamycin lfd nearly normal but not complete normal pruritus was difficult to control in this particular child which is usual story in allegheny syndrome another child was jaundice at day 18 of life pigmented stool this is why it becomes important birth weight 2.3 kg not sick child and liver spleen both palpable and you can see ultrasound is normal here which may be unlike a uh, biliary atresia patient or cold or cold cyst bilirubin is conjugated and all other investigations which you would do normally four five investigations are important they were normal in this child and liver biopsy had shown giant cell transformation and this patient see at the end we say is idiopathic neonatal hepatitis but that is not enough in any child we could not find any etiology in this patient but he had giant cell hepatitis we cannot label him i will not label this patient idiopathic till i will say suspected idiopathic till the till the time i will see at one year of follow up everything has settled in this patient spleen has gone bilirubin has lft has normalized liver is also not palpable ultrasound is normal that is the time when i will label this patient this was a case of idiopathic neonatal hepatitis there are 10% of such cases who may actually have progression of the disease or they may have fluctuations in the uh, presentation and they are actually some kind of a metabolic disease and that has to be seen to be searched for there is a good category of progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis sizable proportion in india all the centers are reporting 
and they are different types. Mostly they have an overlap. And also nowadays we have PFIC4, 5, 6, and always we have debated among ourselves that the best way, there may be some clinical clues, uh, but best way is that if we can do genetics in them. So genetic evaluation as of now becomes important for categorization of some of the neonatal polystasis syndromes. And notably among them is progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. Then we can categorize them and treat them accordingly. So my summary, recognize all entities of neonatal cholestasis, act fast. I find that there are three subsets of pediatricians at the moment. My respected colleagues, honorable colleagues, whom I respect a lot, there are three categories. One category is who will refer the case on time because they want that uh, things should be done properly. Number two, category who will leave it to the nature to settle it, but it does not get settled. They do a lot of harm to the children. Recently, I had my student from Hyderabad who is a full fledged qualified pediatric gastroenterologist who called me and said, Sir, what will happen to this entity? Patients are coming so late. The reason I said, he said that, can I use your card? I said, yes, why not? Use the card and through some societies. So the time is that we should be aware of this disorder. We should not uh, hold them with ourselves. And third category is they will do the investigation, but they are not targeted investigation. So we should not just uh, do all sorts of investigations and patients, we should go in a specific manner as I've shown the algorithm of management in these patients. Where tar is tar is tar, please forget about it. Scan, 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 please forget. We do scans. I also do, but in certain specific situations where we're in ambiguity. So neonatal cholestasis, the enigma should discontinue now in this country. And there are many other things which have developed over the period of time. This is not the scope of this lecture and uh, this genetics, shrinking idiopathic entity, uh, evaluation and many other things. So I am very grateful to IAP Tamil Nadu, Dr. B. Ramesh Babu, President, K. Rajendran, Secretary, Dr. Gopal Subramaniam as the treasurer. Thanks and gratitude to IAP Tamil Nadu. Special thanks to Dr. M.S. Vishwanathan for giving me this opportunity to talk here. All fellow pediatricians of Tamil Nadu who are listening to this lecture. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, sir. Wonderful lecture. Gave a lot of positive thoughts and good advice for the general pediatricians how to act faster. There are some interesting questions from Professor K. Nidinjali and sir. First mm -hmm. question is, how specific is your card test? That is full appearance in differentiating medical against surgical causes. Yeah. Are there any studies done in our setting with stool and urine as a screening test? Is there any possibility of some other scoring system incorporating stool and urine color and lab parameters as done in our setting as a screening test? See, stool card has been developed by Taiwan and many other countries in the past. And stool card has been found to be very accurate, to a large extent, more than 95% accurate in identifying uh, or differentiating between uh, basically for biliary atresia. And here in India, what I did for three years is a prospective trial, control trial, which I have published now. It was a very difficult trial. And in this way, we have done along with the daily one group for the, we, we needed controls for the children who can be compared with that. And we have to take the immunization group as the control for their urine and the stool. And this card we found very accurate. We had actually a group of people, parents also involved in, in assessing those cards. And uh, it was a very well tailored and uh, um, uh, a study foolproof study and it is mostly maybe if not 
95% it will be accurate in identifying the cause of uh, identifying neonatal cholestasis number one because the urine card is also there along with and also in identifying the uh, biliary atresia group. So the second question from same uh, Professor Nadinjian, how, how uh, specific are the GGT and pi nucleotides in diagnosis? In gamma GT is very good. It is very good if you find high gamma GT, always think of biliary atresia. And if you have in combination with ultrasonography, pale stone in a child, otherwise nicely or a good looking baby, otherwise good looking, I mean, say not sick baby, then we should uh, give importance to gamma GT. Normal gamma GT does not mean that it is not biliary atresia. Not that gamma GT alone becomes a tool for confirmation or diagnosis of biliary atresia. High gamma GT will take you to that lead of uh, maybe this is biliary atresia. Normal gamma GT does not rule out, in fact, biliary atresia. So it's a lead pointer towards that. There is no single test which can actually confirm biliary atresia. It's only perioperative cholangiogram. We have done in the past, as I have shown you, the consensus meeting 2000. We have taken the data from eight medical centers and six surgical centers. And six surgical centers showed negative laparotomy rate in these babies 30%, which is very high. Very high. Even the best institutes of the country showed 30% negative laparotomy. Unnecessarily being open for biliary atresia when mm -hmm. they did not have. Therefore, it becomes very important to look at, do a liver biopsy also in this patient. So the last question, is there any scope or research on preventing this dreadful disease? No, no, no. There is no way. No prevention. We don't know the reason for this. It's a worldwide problem. It's a worldwide problem. The only way is we have to be conscious and we should be uh, aware of the fact that we have to, if we are not able to resolve quickly, these patients should be resolved within first six, to eight, six weeks or eight weeks. If you delay, the opportunity is lost. I saw in Bangalore myself, this is a elite city here. All people are literate. Three cases of biliary atresia who are not wrapped on time and all the three required transplantation. Why? And the parents started asking me, why is it so the doctors are not wrapping cases on time? I said, That's, there is a need for more awareness in our country. There is no other answer. But a lot of things have changed. Over the period of 20 years now, biopsies which were not done earlier, Scans have gone down, nuclear scans, everybody is asking for nuclear scan. And also what we have seen, the stool color has given, been given importance. To this, uh, to some extent, I would also give uh, credit to transplantation teams of India, who now actually are changing biliary atresia for transplantation. But we should not leave it to that level, to that point where we leave them for transplantation as an option. We should do our best to begin with. Still the best treatment is podiatrostomy. Recognize, do podiatrostomy, and if that fails because of one or the other reason, then go for transplantation. We are not against that. Should, should be done. So the last question from Dr. Dharmalingam. What is the survival rate of these kids? Very good. With which cases? There are so many entities. See, I will tell you for India. We should always think of number one, biliary atresia. Is there a cholecholcyst? Cholecholcyst is very easy to die. Good ultrasonographist, if he does ultrasound, finds the cholecholcyst, you operate. There is no other thing. You have not to do torch and this and that. Nothing. Just get it operated. Patient is get, patients are all right. They become normal. See, that is 5% of all cholestasis. Then you see, we have another important entity that is metabolic group, galactosemia, tyrosemia. That should be looked for. Simple thing is alpha beta protein, as I mentioned to you. And also, uh, we can do urine for reducing substance in non-glucose, right? Two things should be suspected. Third is PFIC. 
PFRC, progressive family interview. You need not to go very fast with them. You can take your time. It doesn't matter. They are it's not devastating. Only thing is the quality of life. And lastly, I would say some patient may have got her, uh, this uh, herpes infection, which may present with acute illness. They are more like acute liver failure. Rest, cytomegalovirus, this and that. Forget about it. I don't waste time. I don't waste uh, time and money on these things. Last is what idiopathic neonatal hepatitis. Forget about the rest. Because our pediatrics in general read the books, they see the tables, and they see a lot of entities in there. These are five things you focus on. In India, you will reach 96% of the cases of neonatal courses you'll be able to cover. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk and uh, narrowing down to five common causes from your yes, rich experience. That's all. Rich experience. Thank you. I request uh, Professor Ramchandran, my co chairperson, to conclude the session. Uh, so on behalf of uh, Professor Tangavelu and uh, myself, I thank uh, IAP Tamil Nadu State Office Bearers uh, and also Dr. Vishnathan for giving us this opportunity. And uh, the speakers who did a very excellent job actually educating the general pediatricians on important aspects. Dr. Neela Mohan, Dr. Vishnathan and uh, Professor Yacha for uh, enlightening us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Professor Tangavelu, sir, and uh, Dr. Ramchandran, sir for chairing this session. Very kind of you with the rich experience also. You are nicely moderated. And Professor Yachar, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Neelam, thank you very much. We'll move to the second session. Uh, second session, um, so Professor Yachar, can you please uh, stop your screen share? Yes, yes, yes. I have. <laughs> stop. Okay. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. So we have uh, Professor Nirmala, who is act, uh, Professor uh, of Pediatric Gastroenterology and she leads the Pediatric Gastroenterology Department in ICH. And uh, she uh, is a busy, very busy government center. So I would like her you know, uh, to give her inputs also for the next session. And she's also a visiting consultant at Vijay Hospitals and Child Trust Hospital. Thank you, Madam, for sharing the session. And the other uh, uh, chairperson today for this session is Dr. Lalita Janegraman, who is a very senior pediatrician from Child Rest Hospital, Chennai. And uh, she has uh, had overseas experience in Australia and also uh, in uh, United States. And she also is a very active uh, teacher for DNB program at Kanji Kamakodi. And she's also a PALS instructor and as well as zonal coordinator. And she has been a faculty for, I know, IAP, uh, ALS course and as a guide for PhD research scholar. Thank you very much, Dr. Lalita Johnny Raman, Madam, for chairing the session. Over to Dr. Nirmala and uh, Dr. Lalita. Before I just do that, and I just want to remind the audience, we have got a very nice three interesting talks next. Um, one on GRD by Professor John Matai, and you have got a very nice panel discussion on clinical cases and as well as don't miss the last session, which is on approach to functional uh, abdominal pain, which is a very important topic for all pediatricians. Over to the chairpersons. Thank you. Thank you, Vishwanathan. Uh, thank you, Vishwanathan, for the opportunity. I thank uh, Vichu and, uh, and the team IAP TNSC for giving me the opportunity to be part of this CME today. Uh, vomiting, I think vomiting, all of you know, vomiting in children is a very, it's a nightmare for the pediatricians, uh, especially, in, in, especially in infants. And to differentiate between which is pathological and which is not pathological is very, very difficult. And uh, this, this is a very, very important topic. And uh, to introduce the speaker, Professor John Mehta, he has been the professor or the head of the pediatrics as well as pediatric gastroenterology at uh, PSG Med Medical College for many years and recently moved into Masonic uh, Center uh, as a pediatric gastroenterologist. He has been the immediate past president of ISPAHAN. And, uh, and he has, uh, he has uh, published many journals, uh, many, uh, he has been this uh, article having published many journals and also chapters, he also authored many chapters in books. For me, he's a very, very excellent, uh, he's a excellent teacher and a very ethical clinician. So we cannot find anyone better than Professor John Mathai to deliver this lecture on uh, uh, um, evidence-based approach to GRD in children. Over to Professor John Mathai for his lecture. Thank you, Dr. Nirmala. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nirmala, for uh, introducing me. Thanks to the IAP office bearers and to uh, Vichu for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, after that uh, difficult topic of uh, uh, neonatal cholestasis uh, handled excellently by Dr. Yacha, we'll move on to something a little more uh, simple, but I think creates a lot of problems. Now, the topic is gastroesophageal reflux. Now, I'm not going to go into uh, the pathology and pathophysiology and all that because I know all the audience are uh, pediatricians. So we will only look at some of the important aspects and clear some uh, concepts in uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, GER is physiological in most in infants and it improves with age. 50% of infants less than six months will reflux, which decreases to around 10% by two years of age. Now, this term happy spitter is a baby who is happy but goes on uh, spitting uh, milk out. And none of these happy infants need any evaluation. All that it's needed is that parents uh, need some reassurance. Predict the natural history that it will uh, improve with age and monitor their weight gain. Reflux in an older child is always pathological. That means an adolescent who comes or a 10-year-old who comes, an obese child who comes, if the child is refluxing, it is pathological. That is not uh, physiological. And prevalence now is around 5 to 8%. The, the most important aspect of diagnosis of reflux is a good history and a clinical examination. The first point is to differentiate regurgitation from vomiting. So what is regurgitation? It's an effortless process. It's passively bringing up gastric contents into the oral cavity, and it sometimes comes out of the mouth. Just because the baby doesn't bring it out, it doesn't mean that the baby is not regurgitating. In other words, regurgitating out is only the tip of the uh, problem of reflux. Baby can reflux into the mouth, chew on it, and, and it goes back again. But it's a passive process. Whereas vomiting is a forceful expulsion of gastric contents. That's an active process. Therefore, there's involvement of the respiratory and abdominal muscles which are contracting and the baby retches and brings it out. It's a centrally mediated, it's a somatic reflex response and it needs effort. It's an active uh, process. That's the first. Second question is how to differentiate gastroesophageal reflux from gastroesophageal reflux disease. Reflux is involuntary passage of gastric contents into the esophagus with or without visible regurgitation in an otherwise well infant. You call it as reflux. GERD is a pathological form of GER, in which case there are clinical consequences like loss of calories and failure to thrive, or there is exposure of the esophagus or respiratory tract to gastric contents which are acidic, giving rise to clinical symptoms. It's important to differentiate between or use terminologies correctly. Reflux is physiological in a well baby. Pathological is when we call it as a disease, when there are clinical consequences of either loss of calories or damage to the respiratory or esophagus. What are the predisposing factors in infants? Premature infants are more prone for reflux. If they've been on theophylline, caffeine, etc., for apnea, then yes, uh, they are more prone for reflux. Congenital anomalies of the respiratory tract, neurologically impaired babies or babies who have been on nasogastric tube placement for a long time. Babies who reflux for unexplained reasons, please monitor their neurological development because often uh, the ones who don't improve with age are babies who do have an underlying neurological disease which manifests much later, maybe uh, sometime towards the end of, uh, end of the first year of life. Now, the first case is a two-month-old baby who throws up soon after feed, three to four episodes per day, exclusively breastfed baby, birth weight 2.7, second child of the mother, so there's enough milk, brings out small amount of milk when put down on the bed or onto the shoulder. Well, happy baby has gained from 2.7 to 3.5 uh, within a matter of two months. System examination is normal, and your diagnosis in this case should be gastroesophageal reflux and nothing more. Let's look at these babies uh, and see what reflux is. Look at this baby. This is a classical reflux. This is a classical reflux. Look at this one, he's smiling. And the baby is bringing out uh, small amounts of milk. 
Yeah, look at this. This baby brings out through the nose, but it's still only a gastroesophageal reflux. Many parents get concerned when the when the when the, the reflux aid comes out through the nose. There's nothing to worry just because the reflux aid came out through the nose. It only means that his nose is patent and the, uh, there's no block in the nasopharyngeal area. Here's a second child, a one-year-old with bloodstain vomitus, two to three episodes in 10 days. There's no history of Melina. He was taking feeds well, for, not taking feeds well for two weeks. Always had some regurgitation, but from about eight or nine months, the reflux was more. On examination, he was a well child, no pallor, no splenomegaly, counts and platelets are normal. There is blood in the vomitus, so it has to be a gastroesophageal reflux disease. And look at that uh, endoscopic finding. Uh, the whole lower esophagus is, is ulcerated. Now, this is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, the first question, when in, is reflux in an infant not just physiological? In other words, what are the red flag signs in reflux? Symptoms within the first one week, which are quite severe, always worries. Failure to gain weight coughing or choking while feeding. If there is any amount of blood, even if it's a very tiny amount of blood, that is not physiological. Worsening with age, particularly after the first three or four months, or an onset after the age of five or six months is pathological. Constipation and abdominal distension associated with reflux and a baby who has developmental delay. These are the seven red flag signs for me as far as an infant with uh, reflux is concerned. In the absence of these seven, I would like to make a diagnosis of a physiological problem or a gastroesophageal reflux and reassure the parents that the baby will, uh, will, will improve with age. Here's a third case. The 15 month old child, episodic vomiting last three months. Sometimes it is bilious, no other problem uh, otherwise well child, weight, no weight gain for the last six months. The ultrasound uh, was unfortunately reported normal, but this is bilious vomit, bilious uh, reflux. When a baby has reflux, uh, which is bilious, that cannot be uh, considered as gastroesophageal reflux. This indeed was a malrotation of the gut and it was picked up on ultrasound. So look for red flag signs and you will be able to pick up the ones that you will need to intervene. When should you investigate reflux? As I said earlier, reflux is a GER is a clinical diagnosis, and no tests are required for happy infants with normal growth and development, or an older child with typical symptoms of a heart birth. Don't investigate. I will come to the treatment later. Investigate only those whom you suspect esophagitis, those who have red flag signs, those who have persisting or recurring symptoms after you have treated them once, or a child who's got extra intestinal disease, I will deal with uh, them one by one. Now, what are the investigations in GERD? You know all of them, SCOPY, contrast study, scintigraphy, esophageal pH monitoring. The last one is called MIIPH, which is not available in most centers of this country except one or two. So I will not touch on that. I will tell you when to do all these other investigations. Now, how and when does endoscopy help in a child with reflux or reflux disease? You can visualize the esophageal mucosa. That's the greatest help of doing an endoscopy. You can also assess the function of the lower esophageal sphincter to see if it is closing properly. You can diagnose achalasia. You can diagnose those rare cases of strictures or hiatus hernia or achalasia. You can also obtain biopsy for a histological study. Sometimes you will get a surprise diagnosis like eosinophilic esophagitis, et cetera. So endoscopy is quite useful in uh, children who come or who have a reflux disease pertaining to the esophageal mucosa. What's the role of barium swallow? And I, as I said, as Dr. Yacha had stressed earlier in the talk on neonatal cholestasis, it's, it's not that every child needs every investigation. You need to tailor your investigation depending on what you are suspecting. When do you do a barium swallow? First, what are the disadvantages of a barium swallow? Now, reflux is an intermittent phenomenon. So just because you did not demonstrate a reflux on a barium swallow, it doesn't mean the child is not reflux. It's a very unphysiological setting. Of those of you who have tasted or smelled uh, the barium, 
you will know that it's very surprising if you don't ref reflux it. Looking at the barium itself, you, you feel like reflux. It's got a very low sensitivity in reflux and a very low specificity in GERD. Therefore, a barium swallow is a low level investigation in a child with reflux disease. So when do you do it? We do it when you suspect a malrotation, when you do a height, when you suspect a hiatus hernia, or you suspect a gastric outlet obstruction. In other words, it's useful in the presence of an anatomical anomaly in the respiratory tract predisposing to reflux. Otherwise, do not do barium in a, in, in a child with a reflux. Why and when do you do a 24 hour esophageal pH monitoring? It measures the magnitude of acid reflux in the esophagus over a 24 hours in a physiological setting. Like you put a halter, you put a, a, a probe, stays in the lower part of the esophagus, monitor it for 12 or 24 hours, and then pick it up and then assess and see whether how much the child is ref how much acid pH is noted in the esophageal probe and whether it is coinciding with the symptoms. In other words, child may be refluxing, but that may not be the time the child is complaining of the chest pain. So is there a correlation between the symptom and the reflux and the duration of the reflux? Uh, the probe, as I said, is placed in the lower esophagus. Uh, the greatest advantage is that uh, it can correlate the fall in pH. Uh, with the patient symptom episode. It's the symptom occurring the same time as a child is refluxing. And that's a great advantage uh, that you have uh, with 24 hour or 12 hour pH monitoring. You can also evaluate the efficacy of uh, anti-acid therapy that you're giving. Unfortunately, it's got a very low sensitivity. It's only less than 80%, 40 to 80%. And therefore it's not considered ideal and uh, it's not routinely recommended. <clears throat> it's now uh, replaced with what that investigation that I, uh, I spoke about, the MIIPH study, but since it's not available, I'm not going to discuss that in detail. What is the role of isotope scan? What do you do? You feed the baby with milk containing the, the isotope and you scan the esophagus and the lungs. <clears throat> what do you, when do you do it? You do it if you are suspecting reflux as a cause of recurrent or persistent respiratory symptoms. That's the only time you should be doing a milk scan or what you call isotope scan. It assesses only the immediate postprandial reflux. It's got a very high specificity. That means if you find the isotope in the lung, it means the baby is refluxing into the lung and it is the cause of respiratory symptoms. That means GERD uh, is there as a cause of the respiratory symptom, but it's got a very low sensitivity. That means a normal scan does not rule out aspiration or respiratory symptoms. What are the non-pharmacological therapies of reflux? And this is what I think most people would like to know. There's feed thickness, positioning and feed volume, lifestyle modification and changes of feeds. Feed thickness commercially are available in the West, not available in our country. In our country, people have used rice powder or nestum and things like that. There are no control studies proving its efficacy. So in our country, in the absence of these commercial feed thickness, you could try one of these, but may not work very much. Feed volume and positioning in infants, you must avoid over, overfeeding because a large number of babies these days are overfed, particularly if it's an artificially fed baby. So weight gain is a good guide. If it's a baby who is overweight and is refluxing, the, the solution lies in reducing the volume and the frequency of feeding. Infants uh, prone and left lateral positions do decrease GER, but because of worry of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, it is not recommended for infants. Elevation of the head and with the crib by use of chairs is very popularly done. Again, it may reduce the reflux, but it's not recommended because when you put a baby with the head up, it compresses the uh, abdomen and uh, leads to sometimes aspiration or breathing difficulty in this baby. So elevation of the head end of the crib or use of chairs, et cetera, is also not scientifically recommended at this point of time. Older children, you can use left lateral position and head end elevation because there are really no issues. So in infants, positioning has uh, very little or no role at all. An important question, changing formula in infants, a formula fed infants, uh, these days, everybody is very fond of making the diagnosis of cow's milk protein allergy and uh, going on into, uh, 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 into uh, hydrolyzed formulas, etc. 
Now, features of GERD and cow's milk protein allergy overlap, and unfortunately, they, they occur at the same age. But reflux is unlikely to be the only sign of cow's milk allergy. I want to stress this point. Do not look at reflux as a cause of CMPA if that is the only symptom. If there are other things that you need to worry about, yes, look at it. But it cannot be the only sign of cow's milk allergy. Incidence of cow's milk allergy so far has been lower in India compared to the West, but the number, unfortunately, is increasing and we do not know why. It probably has got to do with early introduction of formulas in newborn ICUs, etc. But these days, we are finding much, much more incidence of CMPA uh, than earlier. You must consider a hypoallergenic formula only if the baby with reflux has other signs suggestive of CMPA. And I would always request that a second opinion be obtained before going on to uh, an extensively hydrolyzed formula, which is not only expensive, it's also tasteless and, and not recommended. What are the predisposing factors for reflux in older children or adolescents? The commonest is obesity, chronic uh, respiratory disorders, neurological impairment, hiatus hernia, and of course, diet which contains fatty foods and things like that. And the lifestyle modification in adolescents, everybody knows it, you can recommend it, but they are not going to follow it in any case. Now, what are the pharmacotherapy of reflux? There are three, acid lowering agents, barrier agents and prokinetics, and I will deal with each one of them one by one. Remember that antacids do not reduce the reflux. Reflux goes on. It's only that you are converting it from an acid reflux into a non-acid reflux. That means reflux is there. They do not reduce reflux. So a baby who is vomiting and losing calories and failing to thrive, putting them on long-term antacid doesn't work because it is not an acid-related problem. Useful only when the symptom is due to acid. Like, for example, it burns the esophagus. Yes, they need to have the reflux converted into an alkaline reflux. Proton pump inhibitors are the most potent, followed by H2 receptor antagonists and conventional antacids. And this slide will tell you uh, why I, I mentioned that. Now, this is a parietal cell that I have demonstrated. And there are three receptors which stimulate the parietal cell to produce acid, one of which is histamine. And you can see the exchange between uh, uh, the hydrogen ion and the, and the chloride and potassium ions, resulting in secretion of hydrochloric acid into the stomach. And this is the proton pump. So this is the, the receptor, this is the pump, and this is where the acid is. Conventional antacids that we use for a long time just plain neutralizes the hydrochloric acid that is in the stomach. Therefore, they're not very effective. H2 receptor antagonists like ranitidine, they block that receptor, the histamine receptor. But as you can see, histamine is not the only receptor that stimulates a parietal cell to produce acid. There are two other receptors. The proton pump, however, is the only mode of production of gastric acid. And PPIs, or proton pump inhibitors, block that final step in gastric acid secretion. And therefore, they are very powerful, much, much more compared to uh, H2 receptor antagonists. Some points about PPIs. It takes three days or four days to reach a steady state. That's because all the pumps don't get blocked uh, when you give it on the first or the second day. It's, it's, a, it's a graded response. So since it takes three or four days to reach a steady state, it's not very good for an SOSU. Somebody's got a heartburn. Going and peep, taking a PPI doesn't work because you, your acid production is not cut off completely. So if you need, this is basically for pediatricians who have acidity, go and use an H2 receptor because it acts immediately. Uh, PPIs don't act. They are not as good as an H2 receptor. Should be administered before a meal because it needs acid for uh, it's, it's stimulation or it's breaking. First line therapy for all erosive esophagitis and empirical therapy you can use without an endoscopy for older children who have typical symptoms and the duration of treatment is given there. Long-term use of PPIs is not recommended because it increases the gastrointestinal and respiratory infection and that's the percentage that's given. There are other complications as well, but therefore do not put children on 
PPIs for a very long time. Remember, acid has a role in, in our digestion process. Uh, it's, it makes sure that the food that goes down into the intestine is sterile, clean, the bacteria are killed, etc. So cutting off the acid in the stomach is something that you should do with a lot of caution. There is no difference in efficacy between the various PPIs that are available, esomeprazole and uh, lansoprazole. And efficacy-wise, it's the same, uh, whatever companies might claim. Now, H2 receptor antagonists, as I said, blocks the H2 receptors. Very rapid onset of action. Not suitable for long-term acid suppression, unlike a PPI, because they develop tolerance or tachyphylaxis after a few weeks. I've given the dose there less than 30 kg. It's 5 to 10 milligram per kg per day in two to three doses and more than 30. It's 150 per uh, twice daily. There is a concern about this NDMA in, uh, in the, in the ranitidine. It's a probable ca carcinogen and the FDA has therefore withdrawn the license of all ranitidine preparation. They are looking at it. Again, we might get a, a, a second look at this issue uh, soon. Currently, it is available in this country. It's not bad and you just need to use it with caution. Prokinetics, they've thought to increase the gastric emptying and thus reduce the reflux. However, there is very little evidence supporting its use and it's not recommended in view of the cardiac side effects. Conventional antacids, no role at all, very low efficacy. And particularly if you use that at infants, you will get milk alkali syndrome or aluminum toxicity. So currently, there is no role for any conventional antacid. Surface agents, the one that is commonly available is sucralfate. It forms a surface barrier, preventing the, uh, the mucosa from getting exposed to ac acid. It works in the stomach. It does not work in the esophagus because it doesn't coat. Therefore, it does not have a role in gastroesophageal reflux disease. Baclofen reduces that reflux and increases gastric emptying. It's useful in adults, but there's very little data on its efficacy in children. There are significant side effects, so do not use do not uh, use baclofen in children unless there are coexisting neurological disease or symptoms as well. What's the role of PPI in GERD? It's the first line therapy in all children who have esophagitis, and you can use it empirically in older children who complains of heartburn or epigastric or retrosternal pain provided you are sure of the diagnosis. No need to do an endoscopy. You can use empirically. If you have a scope facility for a scopy, get it done. Otherwise, empirical therapy can be given, but uh, not otherwise. No role for treating GERD with PPI for infants with unexplained crying or distress, what they call abdominal colic. No role. That is not GERD, and there's no role for PPI. Children with extraesophageal symptoms like episodic cough, no role for PPI. Empirical yeah, therapy. Yes, one, minute, one minute left, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'll finish. Empirical therapy of children with poorly controlled asthma, also there is no role. What's the connection between asthma and GERD? It's a common association, but we don't know if it's a cause or an effect. In animals, acid exposure increases airway reactivity. Now, the consensus is that GERD exacerbates asthma but does not cause it. And in fact, GERD could be a byproduct of badly controlled asthma. In asthma, therefore, consider GERD only if there is a coexisting heartburn. There is no demonstrable risk factor for asthma, wheezing soon after a large meal and lying down, and it's refractory to treatment. Those of you who are not fed up of listening to GERD for the last 20 minutes and want to read more about it, Please look at this document, which has been published in the last month's issue of uh, uh, Indian Pediatrics, which is our society's consensus statement uh, uh, published on this topic. So what's the key message that I have for you this evening? In most infants, GER is physiological, improves with age, and masterly inactivity is what you need to do. Investigate only if reflux is pathological or you suspect an anatomical abnormality. Empirical PPI in infants is not justified unless you don't have, unless you, you are in a situation where you cannot refer for a gastroenterology opinion. A four week trial of PPI can be given in older children with typical symptoms. While positioning and feed thickening have limited benefits in infants, lifestyle modifications are important in older children. 
Hypoallergenic formulas, prokinetics, conventional antacids, and sucralfate have no role in routine management. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your crystal clear presentation as usual. We have one question. I think we can take that one question. Uh, from uh, Dr. Dharmalingam. He's asked, any feeding restrictions in a GERD baby? And can GERD cause sudden death in a newborn? Uh, yes, it can cause. If, it's, uh, if the reflux comes up and causes apnea, it can cause. But those are uh, rare situations. Um, and I don't think it needs to be considered uh, routinely, uh, uh, routinely in a baby. And often it happens in a preterm baby. A preterm baby in the, uh, in the NICU is, is where you get into this uh, setting. Dr. Anamali has asked, uh, are you using ranitidine infants? Uh, there is no study recommending ranitidine for you infants. The only one that we can use is esomeprazole currently for children below the age of one year. If you need to use a PPI, use, uh, use uh, uh, esomeprazole. The others may be effective, but we do not have uh, studies on it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank the you. next uh, topic. Dr. Lalita? Dr. Lalita? Yeah, good evening. Sorry, I've got let, let, let me first thank uh, the IAPT NSC office bearers and Dr. MSV to have asked me to chair the session with all these stalwarts and... Uh, Madam, sorry, can you be, be, be a bit louder? Sorry, we can't hear you. Can you be a bit louder? Thank can you. you. Can you make this louder? Hello, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, 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 sir. Yeah. Better, so better, at the better. outset, I would like to thank the office bearers, IAP, TNSC, and Dr. M.S. Vishwanathan for asking me to chair these sessions with all these stalwarts in uh, pediatric gastroenterology. So we have next uh, panel discussion case scenarios, which will be moderated by Dr. Mal none other than Dr. Malti Satyashekaran. She is a senior consultant, uh, pediatric gastroenterologist attached to MGM Healthcare Rainbow, as well as uh, KKCTH. She is actually a role model for most of her students, always uh, pushing them to write uh, published papers. We call her actually a walking encyclopedia. So we have uh, Dr. Malti to chair the session, to moderate the session. And we have two panelists. One is Dr. Nishant Vadwa, who is a senior consultant at uh, Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. He runs a program in pediatric uh, GI fellowship. He has got an experience of more than uh, 200 uh, successful pediatric transplants. And uh, he has special interest in interventional endoscopic procedures in neonates as well as in children. He has got over 90 national and international publications. The other panelist we have is none other than Dr. Palini Raman. Uh, there are no CMEs in this part of the state without Dr. Palini Raman taking active part. Okay, he is a, we call him the star of Dindivanam. He's a very busy practitioner, uh, but very, very rational. And he's academically very active. He's done a number of, uh, won a number of quiz programs. His areas of special interest are infectious disease, hematology, and he's also very tech person. So we welcome both these panelists with uh, moderator, Dr. Malti. Over to. Can I start? Can I share my thing? Yeah. Yes, madam, you can do that. Yeah, good evening. Uh, it's though it's a little late. I'm so happy to see that there are so many participants still uh, listening to us, and I think I should congratulate Dr. Vishwanathan. Before we start the uh, our discussion, I'd like to thank Dr. Lalita who came uh, just last night after a busy outing, and she is willing to join. And I saw Dr. Chellam, and I think I must uh, welcome her uh, for this uh, session also. So ours is a case scenarios and the expert panelists have been already introduced. So we would like to keep it very interesting. At the same time, it should be useful. So we would like to give messages. There are no questions for us. So we will give the messages. So 
all these, when you see the movie uh, Jaws, you find when they open the shark, they will see so many foreign bodies, different, different types. So the same way when we look into the stomach, we see different types of foreign bodies in the GIT. It is quite uh, mesmerizing sometimes. So I would like to ask Dr. Palin Raman, we all know that children are very inquisitive and between the age of one to three years, you find them putting things to their mouth. So here is a child who came to your busy practice. He's two years, six months old. It's brought for an accidental swallowing of as usual. The mother will say, Doctor, maybe button battery or coin, and it's 10 a.m. So no breathing difficulty. Child reaches your clinic at 12 noon with an X-ray chest AP view, Dr. Palni Raman. And I would like to ask you, this is the X-ray. Is it okay? What is the foreign body? It is a foreign body in the GI tract. Should you distinguish between coin and button battery? Is it necessary? First of all, thank the organizers for the opportunity. Um, uh, Madam, actually, uh, the child is uh, uh, coming by uh, around two hours. Two hours is over. So I have to act fast. First, I have to decide whether the foreign body is whether it's a button battery or because the two hours is the time limit for the erosion of the esophagus. So I have to act fast. So I have to decide am I dealing with a button battery or a, a coin. But in case of a coin, there won't be there double rim. The double rim will be there in the case of a button battery. But when you take a lateral X-ray, you can see specifically there is a step off sign. Or that is one compared to the one side, the other side there will be stepping that is slanting or stepping off sign. So these two things will give a clue that we are dealing with the button battery. And two hours is the time limit for an emergency removal of button battery. Otherwise, so can you just tell us the actual yeah. thing? What happens with the coins? Uh, I, if it is a coin, madam. Yeah, if it is the coin, it is usually just a mechanical pressure. Yes, But even that is not good. It not is good. in the esophagus. But yes, like you said, you get a liquefaction necrosis in the esophagus and studies have shown that the lamina propria shows this sort of changes even within 50 minutes and outer layer within 30 minutes. So even the two hours... I think for a pediatrician, as fast as possible, they should come, especially if it's in the esophagus. But anyway, like you said, two hours is over. That time you cannot. What is gone is gone. That's what you're saying. So there is a difference between the two foreign bodies in the esophagus. We'll ask Nishan, if the mom is very sure it is a button battery, and is there some first aid? See, now Dr. Palliraman is saying necrosis will occur. Lamina propria, 15 minutes, two hours is over. Can we give something, Dr.? Second question is, how to manage foreign body in the esophagus? That will be the uh, doubt among all the pediatricians. Even after you remove a foreign body from the esophagus, do you expect any problems, Dr. Nishan? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question and thanks, Dr. Vishwanathan, for the opportunity. Uh, well, we do know that uh, the foreign bodies, especially the button batteries, are notorious and uh, they can cause liquefactive necrosis, which starts within two hours and can cause a lot of damage. Liquefactive necrosis burns as well as perforations. So uh, if there are button batteries, sharp foreign bodies or any symptomatic for that matter foreign body, we need to remove within two hours, ideally. And for coins and smooth foreign bodies, we can wait. But if the mother, uh, if we know that there is uh, a button battery which has been ingested, then uh, definitely we need to, uh, uh, there is something which can be done. Obviously, as we know, it's an emergency. But meanwhile, the mother can be advised to rush to a nearby facility where a pediatric gastroenterologist is available to remove such a foreign body. But she can give 10 ml of honey every 10 minutes, uh, up to a maximum dose of six doses. It has been now found in studies that it helps reduce the injury to the mucosal wall by reducing the generation of hydroxide radicals. I must uh, emphasize it's not a substitute for immediate removal. The first and the foremost uh, thing is to remove this foreign body as soon as possible. We know that even after removal, this liquefactive necrosis may continue. So you can have perforations, you can have other problems even after removal. But ideally, it should be done within the first two hours if it's stuck in the esophagus. Now, uh, the as far as the button batteries is concerned, uh, the differentiation between the button battery and coin is very important for this very reason, because for coin, it's an urgent removal, but for button battery, it's an emergent removal. So uh, the various complications of these foreign bodies, uh, 
can be uh, the formation of uh, fistulas, uh, perforations, and esophageal perforation, tracheoesophageal fistulas, mediastinitis, etc. And for this reason, many a times, even after the uh, removal of foreign body, they have to be kept in the hospital and they have to be managed and uh, conservatively for a while before discharging. Thank you, Dr. Inishant. And I think you would also agree, like at some times we wonder why this foreign body did not go. And probably when you looked, it, when, you, when you removed it, you found a esophageal stenosis and the child, it had to be dilated. Otherwise, the child would come back with a foreign body ingestion again. So I think uh, both Dr. Palni Raman and I think now Dr. Nishant, now suppose you get a call from a mother, a three-year-old girl has swallowed any of the following which on x-ray is seen in the stomach. It may be a pediatrician who's called. It could be a five rupees coin 48 hours ago, a hairpin 24 hours ago, or a button battery 36 hours ago. Now this is not in the esophagus. Esophagus, you've been very clear. You said emergent and urgent. That means all foreign bodies in the esophagus have to be removed, have to be removed, have to be removed. So what will be your approach if it is in the stomach? In the stomach, for the first option, if it's a coin, five rupee coin, I can obviously wait and there is no hurry. And usually one can wait up to seven days for it to pass. Uh, through the stool, in the stools, uh, while for the sharp objects like the pin, we need to immediately remove it as soon as possible because it's already in the stomach. We don't want it going down below and causing problems. Uh, whereas uh, the, third, uh, the third option where we have a button battery in the stomach and it's already been there for 36 hours, well, it needs to be removed uh, as soon as possible because any uh, button battery which has stayed in the stomach for more than 24 hours is an emergency now. We need to remove it as soon as possible. So I think uh, what he said was correct and he, uh, Dr. Nishant, uses a beautiful Roth basket so that it doesn't slip. We always put an ET tube, do it under anesthesia. So we don't put take it from the GI tract and then put it, drop it into the trachea and ask the pulmonologist to remove. So, so you did intervene, but at times you don't intervene. So when are the, what are the conditions you don't intervene and you tell them, okay, you can wait when it's in the stomach? Uh if we have a foreign body which is like a circular object or a coin which is more than two centimeters in diameter or a foreign body longer than five centimeters, if it's a sharp foreign body, if it's a button battery, or if, a, like I mentioned, a foreign body which has been there in the stomach for more than seven days, it's unlikely to go further. We need to remove them. And magnets, uh, now multiple magnets if ingested is definitely an emergency. It's even far more sinister than a button battery. But even if it's a single one, we should remove it. So uh, these are the kind of uh, scenarios where one would like to remove these within 24 hours of presentation. What happens? Uh, have you you've seen these magnets, these earth magnets being swallowed? What happens when two magnets are in the intestine? I think the pediatricians yeah. would like to know. So if you have a child with these small spherical magnets, multiple magnet ingestion is very uh, difficult to treat as well and has a far higher complication rate because if one of these magnets is, for example, in the duodenum or distal ileum or in colon and one of them is in the stomach, they attract each other and they cause fistula formation. So you can have gastrocolic fistulas or ga iliogastric fistulas. And these fistulas, once formed, would definitely cause perforation of fistulizing disease. We need to straight away take them to OT and operate them. So multiple magnets is an emergency. It's even as uh, big an emergency as a button battery in the esophagus. So, but, uh, so, and more so, removing them is also challenging for a pediatric gastroenterologist because sometimes even an, an X-ray can be misleading. And this is for the information of all my pediatric friends there. Uh, pediatrician friends say that uh, if you do an x-ray and you find that there are five magnets which are being shown in the stomach you might actually go in and find only one of them in the stomach the rest of my rest of them might be in the ileum or jejunum or colon so removing them can be a tricky business so uh, kindly take magnets multiple magnets suggestion as an emergency in Nishant also sometimes they form a chain when yeah. you take an X-ray and afterwards they become straight, all sorts of things and uh, they do. So I think now we are very clear about my...
foreign bodies in stomach and esophagus. Small bowel, we just like to say once it is moved, non-moving or static foreign bodies for more than 24 hours, you have to intervene. Otherwise, majority pass unless they are very sharp. So for the pediatricians, so just rush through. Do not panic because 80 to 90 percent of foreign bodies will pass out. X-ray, chest and abdomen, including neck, should be always taken. And as Dr. Palniraman said, take a lateral view if you're worried whether it's a coin or foreign body. Refer to the pediatric gastroenterologist who will decide the need for upper endoscopy. And that is why you keep them nil for, for oral. The pediatric gastroenterologist might call an ENT surgeon if the foreign body is in the cricopharynx. So if you feel it is in the cricopharynx, you can call the pediatric surgeon. Remember, endoscopy is both diagnostic and therapeutic because some of the foreign bodies may be radiolucent and you may not see it. Ultrasound is not a good imaging for localizing FPs, especially in the esophagus. Better to do a CT, especially for radiolucent foreign bodies. So the next case, so it's a preventable problem. Most important, we would like to the pediatrician, is such a preventable problem. And times button battery in the esophagus causing such high morbidity and mortality as Dr. Nishant was telling you. Just imagine getting a fistula, a iota getting perforated just because of a button battery. And treatment at times being very costly. I've heard one of my patients telling, Dr. 50 paisa coin he swallowed, but the cost of removing is 10,000 rupees. So just imagine. So he was feeling only bad about that. So it is a preventable. So we all know the next case in liver disease, the nutrition is affected. They go in for malnutrition. We have learned in our uh, undergraduate that you are uh, poor uh, above and uh, rich below and you have muscle wasting. But here is a chubby child with good appetite. Look at this child, so good looking. And uh, will she have a liver disease? Dr. Palni Raman is a chubby child and has one packet of milk pickies in her hand. She is presented you with abdominal distension, isolated, massive hepatomegaly. You've examined her. Even in your busy practice, you got up, examined the abdomen, and you found the hepatomegaly. Otherwise, you will just pass her off as something uh, she's perfectly normal. So what is the most likely diagnosis in this child? And mention three investigations, which will give a clue. Um, uh, this, this child, you have already shown as a chubby child with a massive hepatomegaly. This is, a, uh, this is a prototype and it is a pattern recognition for a pediat general pediatrician. It's a case of glycogen storage disorder. So it is not a very difficult diagnosis for a regular pattern recognition. So one thing, particularly when you have an asymptomatic hepatomegaly like this, if it is in a very young infant, the diagnosis is different, like space occupying lesion, which I have seen as a hemorrhagic, uh, uh, that is endothelial hemangioma I have seen. And if it is an older child, just now first lecture we had, it can be a fatty liver. Or in other child's normal age group, we can have a chronic liver disease like Wilson. So always don't think isolated hepatomegaly is a like a storage, storage disorder. We, we should have a differential diagnosis. If it is an infant, diagnosis is different. In a toddler, diagnosis is different. In an older child, diagnosis is different. In this case, it's a classical case of glycogen storage disorder. Whenever I come across a thing, first of all, I, I, I want I will do the ultrasound to confirm it is only a hepatomegaly, not a space occupying lesion, number one. Number two, I will do the liver function test to see to that whether I'm dealing with a hepatocyte problem, biliary problem, or reticular endothelial cell problem. And easily I can come to a conclusion whether I'm dealing with a chronic liver disease or not. Number three, since this case is after ruling out, I know that is a case of mostly yeah, storage disorder. I immediately I know the, in this patient, I have to do for the fasting glucose, triglyceride level, and uric acid level, which will clinch the diagnosis. And I will confirm by either by liver biopsy or by genetic test. Thank you, Dr. Palli Raman. I think we should... Uh... You should come to gas, join gastroenterology now. They're excellent. So even if there is hepatomegaly and you feel it, I'm happy he told you that you must do an ultrasound to exclude other uh, SOLs. And so as he said, liver biopsy, we do. We see these uh, large swollen hepatocytes. And when we do fast staining, they take the staining. And when we add diastase, they disappear. But I would like to ask Nishant, especially in this uh, time where we are doing so many genetic studies, how will you manage this child? Do we need to do liver biopsy in all children? Why should we do genetic studies? And uh, your liver transplant, which type of GSD? We know there are more than 13 plus types of GSD. 
which type of GSD requires liver transplant. This, so Dr. Palniraman says, it is a pattern recognition, beautiful name he's using. He could make a diagnosis of GSD-1, but we know that there are some where we have missed and it's gone. So uh, what are you? what is your answer? How will you manage this child? Yeah, uh, now the management principles of a uh, child with glycogen storage disorder essentially is to, one, prevent hypoglycemic episodes, prevent uh, uh, worsening of hepatomegaly. And we now know that if we can feed these children over a 24-hour period, if we can have a use of un uncooked cornstarch uh, as an additive in the uh, meals of these children, helps in reducing peaks of sugars and helps reduce the further hepatomegaly as they grow up. And this has been known to not only improve the quality of life, but also the prognosis of these children. So uncooked cornstarch, which is, uh, is released uh, by, with the help of amylase, uh, pancreatic amylase in the body, uh, is used in optimal doses, if for, for example, in type 1 of 1.75 gram per kg to 2.5 grams per kg of ideal body weight for that particular child. Now, this sugar, which is being, uh, glucose, which is being provided, uh, is to maintain a standard level of blood glucose levels to prevent hypoglycemic episodes. It can be mixed with water and skim milk in the ratio of 2 is to 1. And uh, usually in children beyond one year of age, it is found useful. And it is a very effective mode of therapy for these children, including the night feeding, because many of these children would require uh, continuous night feeding, intragastric feedings, which are uh, to be done uh, using an electric infusion pump. And there are various uh, infusion rates which are used for older children and less than six-year-old children as well. Now, foods uh, rich in starch have to be given at intervals of three to four hours. The first morning feed which these children receive should be at least four hours after the last uh, uh, nocturnal dose of cornstarch. And you, you need to give at least uh, five to six feeds during the day. And one should avoid usage of uh, fruits, uh, juices, and sugary drinks because they get converted to glycogen and lactate and they contribute to lactic acidosis in these children. And the alternatives obviously are stuffs which uh, help uh, provide sugar on a uh, long, prolonged basis over a 24 hour period by using rice puff, et cetera. So managing these children is not just the dietary management, Liver biopsy is not required in all children uh, with the advent of genome sequencing. And once we have had this, this pattern recognition, which uh, Dr. Palin Raman just mentioned, one can directly go for a genetic evaluation so as to identify the correct uh, subgroup. And as we know, the type 1, type 3, type 4, type 6, type 9, these are the uh, GSTs which are associated with predominant liver involvement. And doing genetic studies can help uh, identify the exact type because the prognostication, the treatment, as well as the follow-up of these children, especially the growth follow-up. And I think as pediatricians, it's important to monitor the growth of these children as well because that's an important aspect uh, overall, which needs to be taken care of, including the vaccination bit as well. Because if we are looking at the prospect of some of these children requiring transplant later on, they need to be managed very well in terms of growth monitoring, growth rehabilitation, as well as vaccination. Uh, the type of GSTs which have uh, required liver transplants have been type 4 and type 3B and type 1. And uh, the prognosis, obviously, many of these uh, children require transplants due to development of hepatic adenomas or hepatocellular carcinomas, not necessarily liver failure, but there is definitely a genotype-phenotype correlation between various children with uh, GSD. So you might uh, be very well, uh, have, have to be well versed with the exact type of GSD. And that is the reason why the recent advent of genetic studies, genome sequencing is very useful because earlier we never had that uh, advantage. Uh, so one should definitely go for genetic studies. And the, the types which I have mentioned, these uh, these types will need to be monitored closely with vis-a-vis -vis their growth, their development, the development of adenomas. So you might need to monitor them with alpha, alpha fetoprotein levels as well. 
and you might have to do neuro uh, the imaging in terms of ultrasound and sometimes if you pick something a suspicious lesion you might have to go for a ct scan and many of these children under these circumstances would require a liver biopsy so as to make a diagnosis and then counseling for liver transplant thank you nishan for stressing the importance of uh, genetic studies because earlier when we were doing our pg course we were always taught one and three are the ones which you will see and we used to give a list of differences between one and three and we always thought it was one and three but now the same one which we have made a diagnosis recently i had a child where when for liver transplant it was actually 9c so the amount of money they do spend so if we can tell them it is very very important to do yes we know it's a genetic disorder but uh, so clearly nishant has told us prognostication how to manage each child is different even the diet when will they require a liver transplant how will they manage it's all very important because now the children are living and uh, we have to do something for them yes treatable with a very affordable diet when you pick it up early especially type 1 they do very well we have we have the children who have come to engineering they are doing well nothing has happened as they grew the liver size came down and they are still taking and after that nothing is happening to them all children do not require so i am happy you clear clarified that nishan so uh, as uh, medical uh, thing as pediatricians we are not uh, very good at numbers not maths that's why we came to science numbers we would have gone all to it and uh, computers so let us see dr palmi raman here is a child uh, no past history of liver disease presents with a short duration illness fever nausea mild ictus but the bilirubin is 6.2 direct 3.8 sgot 1250 stpt 1675 prothrombin time 16 seconds all numbers 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 repeat results are also available for you dr palli raman but it's again numbers what is the diagnosis how to confirm what are the dd for such high values of transaminases madam go to the first slide previous slide madam uh, madam this is a 3 year old child with the past history you are told nothing this is the first attack of the yes. child is first attack of the child is particularly parents coming with a yellow, that is ictus they we clearly say the child is having it that so that shows the child is affected with a liver disorder and they also say they have the typical prodromal symptoms of fever and nausea in a common toddler or a little school going child when they come with a thing mostly we are dealing with a clinically a diagnosis of infective hepatitis that is viral a hepatitis the previous slide madam previous slide madam and here the usually the serum bilirubin will be mild to moderately elevated from 6 to 15 or like that and but here clearly you can see the sgpt is more than the sgot that yeah. shows and this particularly in thousands also doctor it is here yes, oh. yes ma'am and here the sgpt is more than sgot in thousands so that indicates mostly we are dealing with a acute insult to the liver it can be whenever we are in thousands we should think about only three things whether we are dealing with the infection or toxins or ischemia in this case there is no toxin or ischemia it is a clear cut case of infection so mostly we are dealing with the viral hepatitis and very very important thing whenever you are dealing with acute hepatitis look at the prothrombin time that is the very important thing whenever the prothrombin time is more than 1.5 or 2 inr is more than 1.5 or 2 it indicates you are in a danger but here the prothrombin time is not by very much deranged that it indicates you are most of the time it will be like this 16 12 seconds and you are safe and the child is fine nothing masterly inactivity will do the trick for this baby i uh, any comment on the bilirubin falling down going up coming down are you happy with those numbers doctor 8 february went up to 1800 will you tell the parents get admitted or uh, do you think that's a prognostic index or is you okay is gpt you're not very much alarmed and why yes, in this in this case it is everything going hand in hand for example bilirubin is going high and sgpt is going high i am not worried whereas if the bilirubin is going high sgpt is coming down i am really worried that i am dealing with a acute fulminant failure and in that case the prothrombin time will give you a clue very much clue in this case the child is going having a natural history that is by 3 weeks everything will settle by gradually so in this week the first at the end of the first week we are having a high bilirubin high sgpt and mostly normal prothrombin time by the third yeah. week the child is going down everything child is recovering course so it is a case of a simple case of viral a viral a I that is they'll be happy with you as your pediatrician so you are able to give them the confidence this is the third day this will go up 
and then it will take a plateau and then come down slash it will never come down and always you're monitoring the prothrombin time and the albumin very good so i think you said acute hepatitis but since there are so many causes you put it as query viral so you've also given this that marked elevation is seen only in these conditions and the moderate and the viral infection so we'll ask uh, dr nishant a little different presentation here's a 9 year old child same five fever nausea jaundice five days now mother does not have history of there's no history of jaundice in the past no medications but there's a combative behavior for two days. The child is irritable. Then there's a liver and spleen. The child may be irritable even if it's hungry or not very happy. But, you know, it's irritable. And the investigations are more or less similar. Sorry, but there is something right, more. Just two minutes more. Yes, we're finishing. So, yes. So, what is it? We can stop with this also. So, uh, so we can see that uh, the bilirubins, uh, the serial LFTs, we find that the prothrom, there is a coagulopathy and there is encephalopathy. Now, these two things in itself uh, mean that this child is in liver failure. And there is a uh, falling liver enzymes with rising bilirubin. And this is an ominous sign. This child should, should immediately be shifted. It needs admission into an ICU care and uh, needs in monitoring as far as the etiology is concerned. So, falls in uh, falling of the enzymes with rising bilirubin is an omnia sign in children with acute hepatitis and this child is in acute liver failure. So, uh, What about this case, Nishant? Jaundice for the last three years, mild pallor, soft and spleen is two centimeters. There is a bilirubin, direct is low. As you CPT is normal, but you know, if you do not do the transaminases and just do bilirubin, someone will keep giving treatment for jaundice. What is your comment on this? So here we have a child with indirect hyperbilirubinemia, which uh, with a spleen. So uh, we should look for any signs of hemolysis in the peripheral smear, which in this child is spherocytes. So, so spherocytosis or many other immun uh, hematological problems where there is hemolysis can present with this kind of a picture. And this is essentially not a liver disease per se. So the liver is absolutely fine. We need to reassure the parents that the liver is absolutely fine. So if the jaundice is present and the, there is indirect hyperbil and transaminitis is not there, then we are dealing with hemolytic jaundice. And uh, that is something we need to emphasize and uh, explain it to the parents. And uh, But if we don't find any hemolysis and we, if we find that the peripheral smear is normal, retic counts are normal, then we can think of a Gilbert syndrome. Uh, a rather... Uh, now, Gilbert syndrome is something which is uh, picked up quite importantly in these settings of adolescent males and uh, commonly found. But if the direct bilirubin is elevated and uh, you have normal GGT, normal alkaline phosphatase and no itching, then there's a rarer entity, which is much rarer than Gilbert's, is of Dubin Johnson, then one can think of this entity as well. So I think uh, the caveats have been already explained in detail. So numbers in liver bi biochemistry are understandable and we have to look at all the values, just not the PILI, not the OPPT. I think we cannot, we don't have time for the fourth case, but now with the WhatsApp, the parents will be sending all sorts of these pictures for bleeding, for rectum. And I just want to ask, because Dr. Nishant, when you have a child painless bleeding and a polyp, uh, we know how they think, what are the instructions? You can just quickly tell them and we'll stop with that because we don't have any questions from the panel yet. Yeah, a painless bleeding per rectum in a child warrants a colonoscopy and polyp is the commonest cause. And before polypectomy, the important aspect is good preparation. So we need to prepare these children a day prior by giving them polyethylene glycol solution at 25 ml per kg per hour for six hours prior to the procedure, six to eight hours. Smaller kids might need to be admitted for this uh, cleaning procedure because uh, and uh, Colonoscopic procedure is absolutely safe in children and uh, polypectomy is the only way these children can be ameliorated and subsequently these children might require treatment for uh, constipation as well if it, it has been there in the past. But uh, uh, for all my pediatrician friends here, painless bleeding per rectum in a child, kindly get these children evaluated from, from by a pediatric gastroenterologist and a sigmoidoscopy or a colonoscopy is something which is very important. The earlier done, the better. It saves a lot of blood loss for these children 
because anemia as we know can have a deterrent for the growth of these children colonoscopy for for diagnosis and therapy the instruments are very good we are using carbon dioxide nowadays so there's not much of discomfort very good anesthesia sedation and we can do the therapy so wrapping up foreign bodies therapeutic endoscopy gsd diet modification patiently analyze abnormal liver biochemistry and colonoscopy for like to thank you and uh, for all your patient listening thank you thank you ma'am thank you thank you dr palni raman thank you thank you madam thank you please do answer questions in the chat box the panelist thank you madam thank you got some questions in the chat box please answer thank you that's fine we'll move to the next thank you the the last the last topic for the day is uh, an approach to functional abdominal pain in children functional abdominal pain in children we know it might be a simple and a very common problem but very very difficult to treat and to deliver this lecture we have uh, dr sirish Dr. Sirish actually is at present is the head of uh, head and in charge of pediatric gastroenterology department of pediatrics, Iras Lucknow Medical College and Hospital Lucknow. He also uh, consults at Spurs Childcare and Gastro Centre Lucknow. He is uh, as per as the current secretary of the Ispagan uh, for the year 2022-2023. He is also the president of the Lucknow Academy of Pediatrics. He is a chief. Editor. We have a, a, a e journal that is Ispagan as a e journal. He is a chief editor of the pediatric gut and liver e journal. is the official journal of the ispagan and is also awarded been the best president award of our aop aop for the year 2020 he has had many publications international as well as national over to sirish for his presentation thank you dr nirmala thank you to iib tamil nadu for giving this opportunity thank you dr vishwanathan i just share my screen Okay. Is it visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, just starting the topic, the topic which has been given is pain abdomen. So, I just put in a few same scenarios. Five-year-old girl who presented with epigastric pain for six months, related to food associated vomiting, and also had streaks in blood. This is another scenario which I is there. It's a seven-year-old boy who has very unlikely pain for two years, pain on waking up. and therefore he is not able to attend school child rolls with pain and he has no other symptoms and the parents are worried the third scenario is an 11 year old intelligent boy who has pain in the lower abdomen for one year has frequent visits to toilet pain is not relieved even after going to school and finally misses the school bus so we have these three different scenarios which i will be taking up and all of these we see in our clinical practice most of us as pediatricians have seen and you must be seeing all these similar type of patients in your clinic so the common issues it's a common age old problem there are change in terminologies which are there with pain abdomen so i will try to focus on it cause is not identified in majority around 75 to 80% of these children there is confusion between organic and functional there is coexistence of also between organic and functional and care of parents and children is very important just not the children the family has also to be dealt with so the current terminology which is chronic abdominal functional abdominal regret abdominal pain so the classical description chronic abdominal pain is intermittent or constant pain for minimum of 2 months 2 to 3% of children this can be organic functional or psychogenic functional is pain in these absence of identifiable anatomical biochemical or metabolic changes which is there you do not have in the absence of any cause you should label it as functional recurrent abdominal is not commonly used now so what is the frequency of this abdominal pain if you see organic pain is around 15% functional is around 70 to 80% and psychogenic is less than 5% in our opd practice so coming to the approach of chronic abdominal pain it basically depends upon the detailed history limited investigations and appropriate management is the is the key to approach so first history is first we need to differentiate between organic from functional we need to ask these four questions try to differentiate identify the site of pain identify the predominant symptom associated with pain 
or if it is isolated periencephalic pain and decide about the probable causes depending upon the site predominant symptoms and the presence or absence of red flag signs so we need to focus on these three four points whenever we are seeing a patient in opd practice so it's not easy to differentiate between organic there is no definitive criteria but remember the characteristics of organic pain are usually localized pain away from the umbilicus it could be right or red iliac fossas there is constant pain it is not going with time it is constant pain which is persisting pain lasting longer usually several minutes to hours there is radiation of pain nocturnal pain is very important if a child gives a sleep and we need to ask a specific question that the nocturnal pain means that the child has slept for 2 to 3 hours and the sleep is disturbed because of the pain it's not in the night time only it's the pain which disturbs the sleep which is very important so we need to ask them these specific question these are well defined pain and associated with sweating or any change in uh, vitals however if you look at the uh, characteristics of functional pain it is paroxysmal periumbilical usually occurs in clusters short duration dull aching does not wake up the child and may present with nausea vomiting or anxiety and sometimes autonomic disturbances how does the site of pain help it is very important to identify the site of the pain so if you see 1 2 3 and 4 these pain are usually the sites of functional abdominal pain but if you see at the look at the a quadrant it is mainly hepatobiliary b quadrant is renal c is appendicular or terminal ileum so you need to categorize where the site and what uh, i have been taught and even uh, by my mentor dr priyacha he says always ask with a pin point of the finger do not ask the where is the region just just ask the child to say point out with a single finger where the pain is occurring so then they put at a specific point and there you will be able to uh, come to the site of pain does the correlation of predominant symptom with the site of pain help yes so we need to identify the predominant symptom epigastric periumbilical pelvic what is the predominant pain so if the predominant pain is epigastric this is associated with dyspepsia or isolated or it is associated with altered bowel habits so we need to identify the site of pain and the associated symptoms so very very important is what are the non gi causes we should think about in a differential diagnosis of pain abdominal so the non gi causes which are very commonly seen is renal uti which is an obstructive uropathy in older children adolescent female children pelvic like pelvic inflammatory disease and ovarian pathology even a chocolate cyst sometimes they present as pain abdominals so metabolic like diabetes porphyria rare but hematological leukemias and vascular like hsp or pan so what are the most important gi causes of organic and functional based on the site since we have studied the site and character of the pain we need to need to differentiate between organic causes and functional depending upon the site so differential diagnosis is pain with predominant symptoms of dyspepsia pain periumbilical or lower abdominal pain so these when we categorize usually in these three habits so if you see predominant symptoms with dyspepsia functional causes most common is functional dyspepsia or aerophagia organic is reflux disease which is the most common and h pylori or pancreatitis if you see periumbilical pain the frequency of functional is all the more there 85 to 90% and organic is quite rare it could be cox or ibd or a malnutrition which is rare but generally periumbilical pain which is isolated is usually functional abdominal pain or an abdominal migraine if you look at the lower abdominal pain with altered bowel habits functional as again adolescent children specifically ibs or habitual constipation constipation children do come with pain abdominal organic again are inflammatory bowel disease cox abdominal allergies malabsorption or lactose intolerance so what investigation should be done what is the level 1 investigation like if a child comes to you in opd what is the first general investigations you should do and if there are certain scenarios you can go to level 2 and level 3 of investigation so whenever a child with chronic or who comes with recurrent pain abdominal is there always get a cbc a peripheral smear that will help you to identify a lot of causes there 
urine and stool examination, including occult blood, an X-ray chest and abdomen may not be necessary in children, and an ultrasound of abdomen. Very important is ultrasound. You may pick up a, a polynocal cyst, who can just present as pain abdomen. So very important is the ultrasound of abdomen. So level one investigation is sufficient if the patient has characteristic of functional pain and no red flag signs. You can stop here if the child is having functional type of pain and just get these basic tests done. And if these are normal, you can go ahead with the diagnosis of functional abdominal pain and treat accordingly. Level two investigations are only necessary when there are red flag signs or there are characteristics of organic pain. It could be a CRP, blood sugar, you can screen for celiac disease. If there is epigastric pain, you can do an endoscopy and investigate for H. pylori. Lower left quadrant pain, you can plan a colonoscopy. It could be a presentation of IVD, small bowel pathology, uh, a CT may be required, a hepatobiliary or pancreatic, you may need an MRCT. Level 3 is very rarely required. Urine for porphobilinogen, EEG, sometimes abdominal migraine, MR angiography, and a CT brain for rare, very rare causes. So, generally in our OPD practice, we will li limit ourselves to level 1 investigations, and that is mainly which is required. Coming to the management, children with chronic abdominal pain, you need to have an interaction with the pediatrician, the family physician, the gastroenterologist all come into picture, just not one isolated form of treatment is there. So organic causes, definitely you need an appropriate, whatever you have diagnosed with the organic cause, go ahead and treat that appropriate with appropriate. Coming to outline the basic framework, the aim is not to completely, this is the first main important thing that we are not here to leave completely the pain. If it is functional, it will go slowly and slowly, it will be going down. So you need to scale down. It is, we have to, on day one, we cannot give this, that the pain will go off as soon as I, I write the medicines. No, it will not completely be relieved, it will be going. So we need to reassure parents that there is nothing organic and seriously wrong. Children to normalize their daily activities, encourage them to focus on studies, sports, extracurricular activities rather than pain. Reassurance helps parents to, and the child to handle the problem better than otherwise. So coming to the management of functional pains, once you have labeled the child as functional, never accuse a child of malingering. It is always said that, okay, this child is having pain. It is there. The child is not malingering. But yes, we need to counsel the child also regarding the pain and the pain, everything about. So pain in the FAP is genuine and felt by the child. So once you give that positive influx, the child is feeling much better. He responds to your counseling much better. Functional abdominal pain is positive diagnosis and not a diagnosis by default. And regular and diligent follow-up examination is necessary to reassure the child that the pain is taken seriously and being treated. But this is a busy slide which we know that what are the possible mechanisms. So basically there is visceral hyperalgesia, uh, pain sensitivity of the visceral organs as well. There could be abnormal bowel reactivity. Bowel is getting stimulated more, abnormal gut motility, extra motility which is causing. And all this is because of psychological stimuli like meal, what could be a high carbohydrate meal obnoxious like an inflammatory process or stress, anxiety, pain. All of this leads to hyperalgesia, bowel reactivity, abnormal gut motility, and the nerves get stimulated and the pain is felt as increased intralumulin pressures. Coming to dietary management, so whenever, these are the first question, what to give to the diet? Because parents, when you counsel them that this is not organic, this is functional, the first question they will ask you what the child should be given. So fiber supplementation is very important. Age in child and the fiber roughly formalized age in years plus five grams. And certain uh, food intake precipitate pain possibility. There is a FODMAP diet which is there, which, is, which, which can be used in certain set of children. And this was a study which was shows that the low FODMAP diet in children and adolescents with functional result disorder, 29 children were included. There was complete resolution of GI symptoms in 92% with bloating, 87 with diarrhea, and uh, 23 children, around 80% reported an improvement. So fructans are the most common symptom causing carbohydrate, and a low FODMAP diet does elevate pain, specifically in functional bowel disease. So this can be tried in certain set of children. So this is what we refer by food map diet, eliminate foods containing excess fructose, lactose, fructans, galactans, and polyols. So this need to be reduced, and these are the certain foods examples which are there. 
coming to pharmacotherapy of recurrent abdominal pains so if you have a child who is having constipation and altered bowel habit give them osmotic laxative polyethylene glycol if they have a features like ibs you can add fiber to them acid suppressants if it is associated with functional dyspepsia or bpi and antiparasitics for certain suspected grd acids uh, or helminthic infection you can add them. coming to the drugs which are uh, the questionable drugs amitriptyline or ssris anti spasmodics or deworming so amitriptyline are the most common drug used in resistance cases our efficacy of antidepressants in management of pediatric fgids is not consistent and avoid anti spasmodic because they may worsen constipation however it can be used in ibsd which is very rare which is present in children however do not use anti spasmodic because they do generally worsen in cause deworming for parasitic infection may be done and always keep a loop of pediatric surgeon if the pain is severe and persistent do not have a counsel uh, have a session with a pediatric surgeon also so what is the overall prognosis 30% of children persist adolescent persist as adults 30 to 50% are cured mostly within 2 to 6 weeks so remember if a child of functional is getting treated within 2 to 6 weeks his response is relapse rate will be also less so you need to trust that in the initial counseling itself that this child will get cured if we follow a certain regime remaining some of them some they present as some other form of the pain the pain of common goes off but they will present as headache they may present as some somatic pains poor prognosis age earlier onset less than 5 years male gender pain prone family maternal anxiety symptoms persistent parents resistant to north on that this is a very important thing for poor prognosis parents do not accept that the child my, my child is having a functional problem they say no there is some cause underlying which the pain is causing please look for it get this test done these children are difficult to handle these children pain are difficult to manage so long term follow up of 5 to 7 only 2% develop so if you have taken all the accounts the side of the pain you have differentiated between functional or organic and you are pretty sure that it is functional these children do not develop organic disease so focus on red flag signs focus on the side of pain and these children counsel them they will do very well in long term to summarize chronic abdominal pain is basically characteristic you need to characterize the pain what is the type of pain we have studied whether it is uh, and you need to see organic and differential between organic and functional on the basis of pain side epigastric or peri umbilical or lower abdominal pain and presence or absence of red flag signs then you classify them if it is functional you classify them into epigastric if it is associated with dyspepsia peri-umbilical if it is isolated or lower if it is associated with altered bowel habit look over the possible causes in these and limit your investigations and treat basically treat them treat on the terms of counseling treat give them some drugs which are which may be required for a dyspepsia and h2 receptor or a pti an altered you can add fiber so give them do not just go them and diet is an important role change their diet lot of uh, things which are there organic if there is definitely needs to be treated so thank you i'll just send my talk and greetings from espigan and lucknow academy of pediatrics in ap thank you to iip tamil nadu dr ramesh dr k rajendra dr gubal and dr my friend dr vishwana thank you just try to to wind it up as soon thank as possible you. thank you thank you dr shish for uh, completing on time uh, there are a few questions in the chat box so okay uh, one is from dr nedin jayan when there is no category of recurrent abdominal pain how to label when a child presents with clear cut free period of days weeks or months between episodes of pain yeah, i could not guess the question uh, when there is no category of uh, recurrent abdominal pain how to label when a child presents with clear cut free period maybe days maybe weeks maybe months between episodes of pain so that is where we need to say that this is chronic abdominal pain what we say that you are trying to say that it is functional organic non organic by the scenario what the what the question has been asked looks like there is no definite period so it is coming intermittently at no specific time it is not coming at a specific time 
and it is there are we need to see whether there are red flags or not very important is the presence of or absence of red flags if there is absence of red flags and the child is having pain like coming once in 6 months we don't need to worry about it probably these these are certain pains which are there which which we can be ignored but if it is coming like a monthly interval or three month once in three months or twice in three months then you need to look and if there is no red flags treat them on the lines of functional abdominal pain that that will be there can i also that uh, yeah. clarify that lalita i think uh, there's a thing what dr nedunjalian wants to know when there is no pain in between can't we call it recurrent chronic abdominal pain dr nedunjalian encompasses intermittent recurrent continuous everything it is just the total duration lasting for 2 months according to the rome criteria recurrent is a description chronic abdominal pain is a diagnosis that is all so you can still use recurrent abdominal pain when you describe but a di- for a diagnosis universally you use chronic because recurrent becomes a description it comes under chronic thank, thank you, you thank you very much madam uh-huh. one more question difference between functional and psychogenic abdominal pain Okay. This uh, what I discussed in my slides also that if you look at the slides, I said that uh, so if you look at the chronic abdominal pain, organic fifteen percent, functional seven to eight, psychogenic. is less than 5% so the psychogenic component is more of which is associated with other psychogenic disorder it is not isolated it will not be like just pain it will have other psychological components which are there the the whole personality will be there so that is associated rather than just labeling the functional children are otherwise doing fine they are for just this pain episodes which are there and coming up but psychogenic their involvement is it is more of just not pain it's extra other symptoms also so see yes very clear just one clarification functional and psychogenic are distinct entity functional is a positive diagnosis so actually now the terminology is changed and now whoever has asked the question we call it a gut brain disorder the whole functional gi disorders terminology itself will be removed because it's too big it's too big so the whole thing is now going to be called because there is the little brain inside and the big brain there so it is going it will be a gut brain disorder there is one more question can intestinal dysbiosis be a cause for chronic abdominal pain okay um could be but but these are all hypotheses which are there but yes there are different studies which have labeled that yes it could be and there are many studies which have said it, it is not but definitely there are studies which say that this is can be there and you need to treat that like an adults they do say that there is if you look at ibs variants in adults they say that this bias is a very important cause of ibs so yes it could be we cannot definitely say but yes there could be we will wind up with that one and uh, thank you professor nirmala and dr lalita jayaram janagiraman for nicely sharing this session for taking through all the questions and dr sirish thank you very much uh, for uh, now those of you who are getting delayed thank you very much and again a very nice uh, talk and it was very clear and people have understood uh, what is the functional abdominal pain and psychogenic etc thank you and th- thank you very much dr maladi madam and dr parni raman and nishant for going through the, all the important case scenarios very nicely and th- thank you very much dr john mata for giving a very evidence based approach uh, addressing all the practical points about uh, gastric reflux reflux disease and um, thank you very much indeed and uh, over to uh, our um, iap team is a team and thank you very much dr tirumurugan sir for actually for putting up with this all this technical stuff and doing a wonderful job really thank you very much and also i like to thank our uh, a uh, dynamic uh, secretary dr rajendran and our visionary president dr ramesh babu and uh, treasurer dr gopal and of course dakshan and amal raj for doing all this necessary stuff and uh, i have seen a lot of senior pediatricians dr srinivasan sir there and dr nirjeri and dr chellan kribagran uh, thank you very much for all for your active participation and over to uh, our iap tnc team um, thank you thank you very much uh, dr vichu
um it was a exhilarating evening with some really wonderful uh, talks i mean to conduct a speciality cme for everybody and keep every, everybody glued to the screen this is one of those well attended uh, cmes i was just looking at those numbers and the numbers are very encouraging both on the zoom and on the uh, youtube so thank you very much for putting up a great team let me start with thanking the uh, convener uh, dr uh, ms viswanathan uh, he has really worked hard to bring the galaxy of uh, speakers i mean uh, like um, so thank you very much sir um i'll thank the chair persons for the evening uh, uh, dr uh, prc sir dr thangavelu sir nirmala madam and dr janagi madam for uh, moderating the sessions very well thank you very much sir i thank all the individual speakers uh, i mean who made the topic so simple i mean neonatal cholestasis is such a complicated topic and still it was made uh, to feel like as though it was nothing and so is rap recurrent abdominal pain and uh, the the discussions by uh, of the on the pediatric uh, or patients uh, problems with uh, by dr malathi madam and uh, dr palni raman and dr sirish everything was fantastic i mean uh, uh, dr neelam mogam uh, neelam dr neelam started when uh, with a wonderful lecture uh, on the whole i think this is one of the best cmes we have organized and uh, so i am very thankful for all the organizers and i thank all the senior pediatricians who have attended as you know this cmes all the cmes are part of the i mean we do get our tnmc credit points so if you do uh, we request you to attend uh, the i mean apply on the web it, it's now only 100 rupees of course we get only half a point but it's only 100 rupees so and uh, hope to see you again in another two weeks time with our primary care pediatricians and uh, keep in touch thank you very much and have a great day thank you thank you thank you sir thank you, thank you all thank you thank you dr vishnu thank you sir thank you madam thank you thank you good night thank you very good night excellent good night. experience bye dr chellam bye 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 chellam bye to uh, nice to bye. see you all with you were almost It's sitting like midnight thank you here. yeah i know you are like you know stand there you know sitting like you are inspired your enthusiasm madam moving it off midnight we are it's inspired midnight really. i couldn't leave because it was so good all her uh, all her second calls and all her pg so she won't leave <laughs> <laughs> yeah am um, bye bye john bye hello ma'am how are you Thank you, Lalita. I'm fine. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Vishwanathan. You did a good job by calling the inviting. Now they will people. they will use you for all the specialities. <laughs> Convener for cardiology. Yeah, Pandey Raman was is wanted by every specialty. Just a human Raman. That's what I have sent him a message. Pandey Raman, I'm a man. I'm not a doctor. Yeah, that's why all subjects are there. Yeah, my mother cut to cut and cut. I'm going to get to see you. Blessings, madam. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. John, bye. Oh, bye, bye. Bye. Bye, bye sir. Dear D. Amal Raj, bye. bye. Good night. Yes, sir. Action. Action. Bye. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. I mean.